Hello, Jess. Jeff, good evening. Hello. I think we're waiting a couple moments. Yeah, in, in a minute here. I was just letting people know that we're, we're uh, got about a minute and then I'll, we'll call roll. What do, you, what do you need? Okay, we'll come to order. Anne, can you call the roll, please? Yes, if you would please announce your name when I announce the jurisdiction. County of San Mateo. County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. City of Belmont. Julia Mates. City of Brisbane. City of Burlingame. Donna Colson. Town of Colma. John Goodwin. City of Daly City. Bud Das Megwa. City of East Palo Alto. Carlos Romero. City of Foster City. Catherine Mahompour. City of Half Moon Bay. Harvey Rarback. Town of Hillsboro. Larry May. City of Menlo Park. City of Millbrae. Wayne Lee. City of Pacifica. Georgia Martin. Town of Portola Valley. Jeff Alves. City of Redwood City. City of San Bruno. City of San Carlos. Laura Palmer Lohan. City of San Mateo. Rick Bonilla. City of South San Francisco. Laura Nicola. Town of Woodside. Daniel Yost, hi everyone. Director Emeritus. Chad Diener. Director Emeritus. Pradeep Gupta. Let me try. Uh, the County of San Mateo. And Dave Pine. Thank you. And County of San Mateo. <clears throat> well, we have a quorum. Okay. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. Um, our first item will be public comment. Does anyone wish to address the board on a PCA related, related matter not on the agenda? If you are, if you want to raise your hand in the uh, in the app, I'd be, that would be helpful. Okay, I don't see any hands raised for public comment, so we can move on to an action to set the agenda and approve the consent agenda. So moved, Wayne Lee. Second, Second. Bonilla. Okay, uh, moved by Lee, seconded by Bonilla. Um, Roll call vote, uh, please. All right. If you would please say yay or nay when I announce your uh, when I announce your jurisdiction, County of San Mateo. Um, yay, Dave Pine. You can also say yes or no. Yes. Uh, <laughs> County of San Mateo. Town of Atherton. Town of Atherton. Uh, yeah, I was muted. Uh, yes. Thank you. City of Belmont. Yes. City of Brisbane. City of Burlingame. Yes. Town of Colma. 
Yes. City of Daly City. Yes. City of East Palo Alto. Yes. City of Foster City. Yes. City of Half Moon Bay. Yes. Town of Hillsboro. Yes. City of Menlo Park. City of Millbrae. Yes. The City of Pacifica. Yes. Town of Portola Valley. Yes. City of Redwood City. City of San Bruno. Yes. City of San Carlos. Yes. City of San Mateo. Yes. City of South San Francisco. Yes. Town of Woodside. Yes. The motion passes. Hey, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the regular agenda, starting with uh, my report. Um, the main thing that I wanted to talk about quickly is we're, uh, we're behind schedule on this. Uh, we need to do Jan's annual CEO review. Um, I am in the process of sort of putting the pieces of this together. Uh, in previous years, we've sort of created a small subcommittee of board members who were interested in, who wanted to uh, just work together on this, uh, maybe four or five. Uh, if you are interested, feel free to, uh, to email me separately and we can uh, put together a committee. I, I will, I'd like to start out this coming month. I don't know if we'll be ready to actually do our review for the June meeting or not, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do for that. But if you are interested, please let me know and I'll put, pull, pull together a small subcommittee to handle that. Um, that is all I have at the moment. So we will move on to the CEO report, Jan. Are you hearing Jim? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, Anyway, th hello to everyone. Hope you're all staying safe and uh, your hands aren't getting too chapped from washing them so much. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So the items I'll go over today are a staffing update, COVID-19 update, and the load impact. Um, talk about avoided GHG emissions calculations, strategic plan update, pg e bankruptcy update, or set update, and then our upcoming meetings. So next, please. So on the staffing side, uh, Matthew Rutherford is starting on June 15th as a regulatory analyst. So we're excited to be um, welcoming him to PCE. Greg Miller, who is a PhD student from UC Davis, will be joining us as a summer intern. And he's doing his PhD work on uh, 24 by 7 renewable energy, which matches exactly what we're trying to do. So he'll be spending 20 hours a week with us through the course of the summer, um, helping to research uh, more on the technical side, how we might reach this goal, what kind of technologies we can use, and uh, uh, preparing a paper on that. So we're excited to have Greg joining us, and he'll be starting also on June 15th. As far as the, um, the position for the manager of distributed energy resource strategy, we are uh, in the final negotiations with someone that we are planning to bring on. I can't announce it yet because we're not quite done with that, but we think we're almost done. Hooray. And then I also wanted to let you know that we have engaged an HR consultant whose role will be employee relations and employee engagement, and she'll be available as an anonymous person for uh, our employees to talk to and we will be introducing her to the staff at our all hands staff meeting on june 17th uh, we currently don't have any open positions posted uh, but that will probably change by next month next so as i have been doing the last few months i uh, want to provide you with uh, the uh, analysis of how the COVID-19 uh, is affecting our load, looking at our overall load, weekly and daily load changes, uh, changes by customer type and load shape changes. So if we can go to the next slide and thank you to Mehdi Shararia who has been doing the work to pull all this stuff together. 
So you can see by this graph at the very beginning in February, our load was about 72,250 uh, megawatt hours per week. And we are now at about uh, 10,000 megawatt hours lower than that uh, pretty consistently now. So this represents about a 14% decrease in our load compared to where we were before all the shelter in place started. We can go to the next slide. And then looking at our daily load, uh, it seems to be pretty consistent now as well. Um, you know, it's, it's up more during the weekdays than on the weekends. There's a the very last day that's shown here is um, May 24th, which was uh, when it started getting hot and we started seeing an uptick there. Um, but the load, sh it's, so, you know, we're, we're kind of hitting an equilibrium here where um, this is what it's looking like. Next slide, please. And if we look at our weekly load by customer type, uh, we, the blue lines are pre-shelter uh, in place. The orange line is uh, mid-April and the gray line is last week. And so we can see that uh, smart, small commercial has con con continued its drop, medium commercial uptick a slight bit as did large commercial. Residential actually dropped this last week. Uh, could be due to the warmer weather and people were uh, not running heater fans and things like that, but um, it does not reflect this week's heat wave. If we go to the next um, slide, it show, just shows the load shapes. Uh, again, the blue line was pre-shelter in place. The orange line was mid-April and the gray line is May or last week in mid-May and so for total PCE we're pretty much um, tracking consistently. Uh, residential's changing a little bit. The load was a little less as we as we noted last week. Medium commercial popped up just a tiny bit as did large commercial in the middle of the afternoons. And then the last slide in this section, uh, if we go, go to the next slide, is just the residential load shape and the, uh, the blue is pre-shelter in place. Um, the, uh, the yellow is the first week of May, the green is the second week in May, and the gray is the third week in May. So it popped up a little bit the week of May 11th, but then it's come back down again on the residential side um, for this last week. So Andy will be talking about uh, this more when we go through the budget and kind of the impact of this reduced load and what we're projecting for the rest of the year. Another area I wanted to talk to you about tonight was the avoided GHG emissions calculations. Uh, back in the day when we used to get together and have lunch together and I would bring you the stats for your city, uh, we'd show what the opt-outs were, what the opt-ups were, and how much GHG emissions were being saved in your jurisdiction. And in the past, the way we calculated that was we would look at the, um, the emissions based on annual usage and PCE's emission factor for that year based on what our uh, sources of energy were. And we would subtract that from what PG&E's emissions factor was for that year to estimate what the savings were in GHG emissions due to PCE uh, compared to PG&E. Uh, but the problem is that if the CCAs were not here, PG&E's emissions factor would be different because they would still have to be providing power to our customers, but we don't know what that would be. So basically PG&E's emissions have improved because of CCAs, because they have all of this clean power and they haven't had to use as much of their dirty power, so they're looking cleaner because of the CCAs. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, we're suggesting that we look at the emissions in a different way and instead compare our emissions versus a baseline emissions factor prior to our inception, and that baseline emissions factor would be the PG&E emissions factor for 2016. 
This results in a larger mission savings estimate because PG&E's emissions factor doesn't keep going down because uh, they've been losing load, um, but it, it compares to a known baseline energy mix. So in the next slide, we could go to that. It shows what the results are of doing this, and I hope you can see these numbers okay. So if we look at the total Eco Plus usage, and we, and we base this on Eco Plus because Eco 100 is 100% renewable, so there are no emissions uh, from that. And in 2016, the baseline emissions factor in pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour for PG&E was 294. And when we came on the scene in 2017, our emissions factor was 142, and in 2018 it went down more as we got cleaner and it was 129. And so when we calculated the emissions, we cal calculated at the baseline power mix using PG&E's number of 294, uh, in 2017 it was about, uh, it was close to uh, a billion, right? 998 million. Our emissions with our power mix in 2017 were about 483 million. And so the reduction in emissions using that baseline was 515 million uh, pounds of CO2. And then similarly, similar calculations for um, uh, 2018 and the cumulative reduction is uh, 1 billion 57 million or um, 479,000 met 79, metric tons. So com this is using the baseline of the 294 for PG&E, so not allowing their, their number to change. What we have been doing is shown here on the bottom, which shows a, about half of the, or less than half of the emission savings um, from that method. So we are proposing uh, going forward that we use these, this approach where we compare our emissions to the PG&E baseline before CCAs were in existence to show what the actual emissions reductions were. So we're happy to um, talk about that further if, if anyone's got any comments um, or maybe you wanna just... Uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions for that right now? It's kind of a, a, a new way of looking at it. Hello. Uh, is that Rick? Oh, um, this, okay. is Mark, this is Mark Roost. Oh, Mark, hold on. Um, I'll, I'll get to public. Um, sure. Pradeep's got his hand up, but I'll come okay. back to you. Pradeep, go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jen, uh, that's a great uh, thinking on your part. I just wanted to ask you, is that uh, choice of that approach is uh, available to us or we need to get it approved by some state agency? Thank you. Um, we don't need to get it approved. I mean, this is just the way we've been calculating it. And eventually, the state is going to come out with a different uh, process. And actually, in the new uh, power content label, they're going to show GHG emissions, which uses an, another, another method. And the, car, and the California Air Resources, Resources Board uses another method. So there is no consistent method. <clears throat> we just felt that this was a little more pure because it compared our emissions, you know, what have we done? What have the reductions in emissions been because of our existence compared to what it was before? So, I mean, we're happy to bring it back to the board for further discussion if you would like that, or we could bring it to the executive committee for more discussion. But I just wanted to um, bring this forward to you today um, because we'd like to move to this approach uh, going forward and for our reporting out to you and your cities and you know what the impact has been of PCE. I think it's a very very uh, creative and uh, uh, new thinking and I think it should be uh, followed up. Thank you. Thanks, Pardeep. Uh, Mark Roost, if you want to make a comment now, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm thinking that a uh, considerably lower price might be available from a company I know that didn't get the solicitation. I didn't know about the solicitation. Um, and 
hopefully there's a little bit of time. I'm writing an email frantically right now. But go ahead and you know, if you guys approve it, just that, 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 that it's okay to spend the money, that is great. I just hope that, that the money won't be spent before I have a chance to get my friend to respond. Um, Mark, I'm confused. We're not talking about spending money on this. Which, which item are you referring to? I'm... The batteries. Oh, um, we're not. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not there I'm yet. Off sorry. I'm off okay. Sorry. This is this. Sorry, we're still. We're on. The, we're on Jan CEO report. So we'll we'll get to the batteries soon. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. No worries. Um, any other questions about this? This question. We had. So we're on this question of of GHG accounting. Anyone else have any questions about what Jan just presented there? Okay. I don't see any. So um, Jan, uh, go ahead. Keep going. Okay. And, um, you know, I don't want to take the credit for this. Actually, uh, KJ uh, has been noodling on this, and this is her kind of her analysis of how we should be reporting this. And also, additionally, it's the um, PG&E's reporting on what its emissions factor is, is very slow. So there's a lag in getting in in the previous method, it would take us a long time to be able to actually make the calculations because we wouldn't have pg these numbers. So if we use this baseline number, then we don't have to be waiting on them. But we'll, um, anyway, just wanted to uh, bring this up for your, uh, for your edification. So let's go on to the next item, which is the strategic plan. And as you know, you all approved the strategic plan at the April board meeting. And we are now an, at a staff level starting the implementation process. So we had a session with Melissa from, Green, uh, from Gallagher Consulting Group on April 29th to walk through the Excel templates that they had prepared. And now each team is working to break their higher level objectives into more specific tactics and developing metrics to measure progress. And our plan is to continue working through this process through the summer, then give an update to the board at your September retreat. Um, so the board has done its work in developing the high level priorities and objectives, and now it's our task to implement this. And um, the September update will be a good time for us to review the metrics that we've come up with and start tracking against those. We are also in the process of developing a high level uh, kind of glossy brochure, similar to the piece that uh, Donna showed us earlier from Filoli that can be used by board members and um, others. We can provide it to legislators, regulator, regulatory folks, um, that will also include a timeline of what we've accomplished to date, as well as, uh, you know, lay out what our objectives are as a uh, organization. So we're in the process of, of finalizing that and we're hoping to have that ready for distribution at the end of June. So next, the PG&E bankruptcy. So, um, as you know, or may not know, as we talked about last month, PG&E's plan of reorganization was mailed to all of its stakeholders. Ballots and objections to the confirmation were due on May 15th. And the plan has the support of the fire victims having been accepted by more than 85% in number and amount of holders of fire victim claims. So that was one of the hurdles that needed to be uh, gotten over. And so that was that was uh, achieved by PG&E. The plan has also been accepted by all but one of the other classes of impaired creditors and interest holders. The dissenting class, the one dissenting class, uh, and this is in lawyer speak, I'm sorry, we got this from our counsel that was working with us on this, uh, consists of holders of pre-petition securities law claims related to PG&E Corp common stock which claims are subordinated to the level of common stock pursuant to the provisions of the bankruptcy code. So those of you who are attorneys out there understand stood what I just said, the rest of us don't, but basically enough of the parties agreed to it that it will go through. The uh, PG&E's plan also has the support of the governor's office, 
which stated that it's compliant with AB 1054 and um, all of the other um, claimants, which were, uh, let's see, those who were holders of insurance claims, the public entities in which, in the areas where the wildfires occurred, uh, the public shareholders of PG&E, the ad hoc committee of senior unsecured note holders of PG&E. Um, so the, their plan of reorganization was, was accepted through the bankruptcy process. And then the PUC had issued a proposed decision on the bankruptcy on April 20th. And in fact, today at their voting meeting, they approved of that proposed decision and they find the plan complies with AB 1054. So um, the whole process needed to be completed before June 30th so that PG&E could have access to this uh, other multi-billion dollar wildfire fund. So it appears that everything is in place for that to happen. Next slide. Um, last week, Thursday or Friday, uh, Jerry Hill was the author, along with three other folks, of a bill uh, titled SB 350, which was a gut and amend uh, regarding the PG&E bankruptcy. And basically, um, this bill provides a, um, a plan B in case PG&E does not, um, falls back into bankruptcy again. And basically, it says that, um, so I'm reading from another document here, uh, would protect residents and taxpayers by um, having the ownership structure revert to a nonprofit corporation were PG&E to um, not succeed in its proposed reorganization. So, um, there were some things in that bill that uh, a number of us were concerned about. And as you know, uh, Mayor Licardo um, has been very engaged in suggesting a different type of organization for, um, for PG&E. And Dan Richard came and talked to all of us, I think it was in December. So Mayor Licardo sent a letter of support, if amended, regarding SB 350 to, um, with three main items in it to emphasize the importance of converting PG&E to a nonprofit entity, to mitigate impacts on customers by minimizing the cost of capital because the expectation is that um, it's going to be very expensive for PG&E to raise the debt that it does because of its uh, poor credit right now. And also for them to focus on safety and reliability of the grid. And as a subset of that to designate CCAs as the primary procurement procurement entity where a qualified CCA can fulfill that role. So we, of course, are very uh, supportive, especially of that last item. Um, this bill was supposed to be, have been heard in the assembly committee today, was, but was pulled. So apparently there may be some more negotiations and things going on with it, and we'll keep you up to date as to what happens here. But, you know, th this bankruptcy is a real opportunity for us to try to get legislation there that would, you know, eventually get PG&E out of procurement and have CCAs be the sole providers. So we're, we're still trying to work that and appreciate the support of Mayor Licardo and, and uh, the 204 uh, mayors and supervisors that are part of that, including uh, Dave Pine and myself. Next. So Merced, we are going to present to the Los Banos City Council on June 3rd, that's next Wednesday. And in fact, I spoke to the city manager today and that is going to be an in-person meeting. So uh, we did not expect that. We expected it to be a um, video meeting. So we're gonna have to figure out how we can do that. Um, our key objective at that meeting is to get the council to agree to submit the request to pg e for load data in order to conduct a technical study. So it would not commit them to becoming a CCA or joining us as a CCA, but really just to have these technical studies done and to see if it makes economic sense, which is what PCE did back in 2015. So um, we have invited other Merced County jurisdictions to listen into the meeting, and we've also invited them to participate in the technical study 
by also submitting requests to pg e for the load data. Uh, Sean Marshall's been working with us on this, which has been great. And um, hopefully we're gonna make some progress here. And then the last slide is just um, update on upcoming meetings. Um, June 8th is the executive committee followed by the audit and finance committee. The CAC will be meeting on June 11th and we all will be meeting again after this evening on June 25th. So happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Uh, <clears throat> any questions for Jan? Okay, I don't see any. I've got a question. Uh, okay. This is Daniel Al, uh, Daniel Yost here. I'll allow myself to be seen. Um, can you say uh, just a little bit more on when SB 350 in its current form would be triggered? This would be if PGE e does not emerge, or what would be the trigger for the new entity? Uh, the trigger, I believe, would be. Um, if pg e emerges and then falls back into bankruptcy so that if they're not able to sustain themselves in the, uh, the with the current plan of reorganization and apparently a number of uh, entities believe that's a real possibility so um, sounds good and is yeah. lcca taking a position or is is there a role for this board to do anything in this regard or sit tight for now? Um, that's a good question since we thought this was going to move through quickly and um, you know the one thing that we were really interested in getting in there was that that pg e get out of the procurement biz business and that CCAs take that over. So I think we can check. I, I think we were before this meeting I didn't have uh, final information on what had happened today and why the bill did not get heard and where it, you know how it's evolving so i think once we find that out we can let you know what kind of action you might want to take um, i think the main ask is to um uh let's see i have a note here from from joe says we can dig in and con convene the ledge ledge reg uh leg leg <laughs> legislative uh subcommittee of the board and figure out what the next steps might be. But um, I don't know exactly what happened today, but we'll, if we know by tomorrow, we'll give you an update in the newsletter or otherwise um, let you know. Thank you. Hey, uh, Rick had his hand up. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I just want to, let, let's see, am I muted? No. no. Uh, Jan, I wanted to know if you uh, needed anyone from the board to join you at the meeting in the Central Valley? Um, yes, that would be great. We're still trying to figure out, it was quite a surprise to me today that they said that they're having a uh, in-person meeting. And it sounds like, I mean, we've all been there, right? It sounds like in order to socially distance there, like about two people can be in the room. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, when I talked to the city manager there, he said they're still trying to work out the um, logistics and if we can do a hybrid of, of being there or being remote, um, how that would all work. I think Sean said she was willing to go down there, but that was a couple weeks ago. I want to make sure that she feels comfortable doing that. I don't want any go anyone going there who doesn't feel comfortable being, you know, around a whole bunch of people. So, um, Including you. Yeah, I'm not, I am not planning to be there in person. Um, so I don't know. Sean had mentioned, you know, before that she was willing to go down there. But um, I haven't heard back from her yet because we just found this out late this afternoon. Okay. But if you'd like, I know Rick DeGoli and Rick Bonilla, you both were pretty active. Yes. Um, with this. And so, yes. yeah. Still interested. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I share your concern regarding going down there and the size of the room and what feels like a you know putting yourself at some needless risk i would go i think it's really important and i would encourage any board members that's comfortable to go unfortunately i have a city council meeting at exactly the same time so i can't do it okay so you aren't able you wouldn't even be able to uh 
video in then. Was, uh, if it was, yeah, maybe I, that, that's, that's fair. Um, my council meeting starts at four. Okay. So, so I don't is, know. So this is Wednesday, June 3rd, right, Jan? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Jan, yeah. I'd be happy to video in as well. I'd prefer to video in, but uh, I'd be happy to, if, if it's helpful for me to say something, I'd be happy to participate. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll I'll stay in touch with all of you as we learn more. Okay. Jan, what time is, are you expecting that meeting to start? I believe it's 7 p.m. Okay. Yeah, but there's no way uh, you're going to be able to get down there. <laughs> from your council meeting yeah i think i could jan so oh and you would be willing to go there in person yeah rick, rick b okay thank you that's very uh brave of you all to do that yeah that that's terrific rick okay. I, th I think it's important we have continuity and if they're insisting on it being in person that'd be great i mean I think it'd be a win for us if this thing happens. Yeah, no, thanks, Rick. That's, yeah, it would be helpful. Okay, um, I'll, uh, I'll stay in touch. I'll, I'll let you know what we find out. Any other Thank questions? So sorry. Yep. Any other questions on Jan's report? Um, okay, I don't see any. So we can move on to the uh, CAC report. Desiree. Hi everyone, this, this is Desiree. Um, so I'll give you an update. We actually had two meetings in the last month. So two weeks ago, we had our regular scheduled meeting um, and we had a great update from Philip on the e-bike program. I think everyone was glad to hear about the program and provide recommendations and feedback. And then we spent uh, the majority of that meeting talking about priority setting and work planning for our committee. Uh, this is something that's still ongoing and our working group has taken back recommendations um, that were made during our meeting and putting those together so that we can take action next month. Um, they'll also come back with, with uh, recommendations on how the committee runs and also uh, a work plan that we'll focus on for the next year. Um, we also spent some time talking about workforce development. This was led by one of the committee members, Joe Fullerton. Um, I think the committee really realizes the importance of this, especially for electrification of buildings um, and hope that Joe and others who are interested on the committee could be involved in this topic as it evolves at PCE, uh, particularly for you know, plans and programs that rely on workforce development. Um, and because we didn't actually have an agenda item on the PG&E allocation of nuclear resources. Uh, the committee felt strongly that they wanted to discuss that and take action. So we had a special meeting one week ago just for this topic. Um, and I think it was discussed before in the board meeting, but just to remind everyone, uh, the committee was surveyed uh, by Kirsten on their kind of views on this idea of taking the allocation of large hydro and nuclear or uh, like the staff was recommending for going the nuclear resources. Um, and back in February, when we had a discussion in our meeting, uh, basically there was no consensus among the committee. I mean, we didn't have it as an action item. It was a discussion item, but it was clear that much like what I saw in the, in the board discussion, um, there, was, there were varying opinions and uh, some members were fine with the nuclear resources and others were not. Um, when it came back to our committee last week, um, that changed and the committee was able to unanimously vote in support of the staff recommendation uh, to forego the nuclear resources and only accept the large hydro resources. And I think the main reasons uh, that came out in the discussion for this were the value of those nuclear resources are now um, on the order of half a million dollars or maybe even less. Um, also that the decreased PCE load forecast uh, due to COVID-19 um, doesn't really make much of a need for these resources. 
And there were also concerns over the negative effects to the PCE brand. So even though there were some committee members that realized that even a small amount like half a million dollars could be used for local programs, uh, there was a worry that um, of what the cost would be to the PCE brand. So I just wanted to let the board um, know that the committee unanimously uh, voted and recommends that the board support the staff's recommendation to accept the large hydro portion only. Um, and that's, that's it for uh, kind of my report from those two meetings. If there are any questions. Uh, thanks, Desiree. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I might speak a little more to this when we get to the, um, to the actual item about the, the PG&E allocations. Um, but uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to thank Desiree on the committee for, for sort of having that discussion again. And I, I will agree with Desiree. It was a very different conversation this time around. And I, I think probably the biggest sort of difference between the two conversations was the sort of value, the replacement value, as it were, of the, of the nuclear allocation compared to, you know, sort of the uncertainty around our, you know, what, what, what this allocation is doing to our brand. But again, what we're, we're discussing this in a few items. I'll probably have a little more to say on that when we get there. Uh, Rick, question for Desiree. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to ask, when the committee was reviewing uh, workforce development, did you actually look at and use our workforce policy number 10? Um, we actually didn't. I, I know the committee is aware of, of policy 10. Um, I think the focus was more on maybe new programs that PCE could be a part of in ensuring that there is enough workforce for electrification. Okay, well, if you look at number 10, you'll see that on page three, it addresses that. So, okay. thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Desiree about the CAC meeting? Okay, thank you, Desiree. And we'll move on to item four, which is a summary as an update from the Audit and Finance Committee. And uh, uh, Andy or Donna, did you want to? I'm not sure who's presenting that one. Andy, if you if you want to go ahead, I'm um, I'm working on my iPad, so I don't have my um, anything. My, my I can't do my materials at the same time. But um, um, please go ahead. Uh, sure. Um, well, uh, there are just uh, there are three things. One is uh, um, we uh, the audit and finance committee reviewed a recommendation for a new auditor, but that and that was approved on, on consent by the full board this evening. Um, there also uh, um, was a, a long discussion about a revised investment policy um, that the audit and finance committee reviewed in detail. Um, and that was also approved on consent uh, this evening. Uh, and the third major item was the draft budget um, that we spent a lot of time on, even more time. And um, I will go through that in my uh, budget uh, presentation of the board in a few minutes. Thanks, Andy. That's great. Um, the one thing I will say is um, I really want to thank the investment um, well, the Audit and Finance Committee, um, in particular, uh, Larry, Carlos, the gang that's been working on that. Um, what we're looking at on the investment policy statement is really just an expansion of the, um, based on the recommendation from the new investment team um, that will allow us to take advantage of um, fair bit variabilities in the market and a broader expanse of um, investment opportunities that really um, actually help us kind of manage risk and diversify the portfolio. So I think everyone should be really comfortable with that. Um, and I'm really pleased with the new investment manager, um, PFM, the account liaison that we have, she, she is just excellent. And uh, thank you, Andy, for doing that work. Um, Larry or Carlos, did you guys want to add anything from that meeting? No, I agree with Donna, and it was interesting to work on, and, and thanks for Andy for leading it. Uh, yeah, no, I, I have nothing to add. Okay, I will just echo uh, Donna's uh, uh, sentiment. I really, um, I really enjoyed meeting uh, Monique from PFM. 
Um, I thought it was a really helpful presentation and I actually am very, uh, I'm excited to have this new invest, revised investment policy in place. So thank you all for the work on that. Are there any questions on audit and finance? Okay, item five is appointments to executive committee and uh, the other standing committee being audit and finance. Uh, this is me. Uh, so thank you to people, yes. several of you um, spoke to me about, about the executive committee and the audit and finance committee. And I would like to nominate um, slightly, a, a, you know, a, the, I will renominate the audit and finance committee and nominate a, a slightly revised uh, executive committee. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so um, the, the nominations for executive committee are the same as, as were before with uh, Julia Mates from Belmont replacing Wayne Lee, who will be stepping down. Um, and uh, the audit and finance committee will stay the same. Um, I, uh, I did have a few other uh, people of interest. I just, I, you know, Julia, I thought was a good fit. And I thank you, Julia, for stepping up. And um, to those of you who have been interested, please, I, I look forward to working with you on something in the near future. And, uh, and I'm sorry, we don't have room for you right now. Um, but if there are no questions, or, or, uh, Wayne, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, I just wanted to say thank everybody for the opportunity to serve on the executive committee. It's been a Real play, uh, privilege and honor to do so. Um, I was a, I was involved when I, and when this whole PC thing was started by by Dave Pine, supervisor Dave Pine, in 2014, I believe. Um, and uh, I've I've grown to, I mean, I've always respected the people on the board, and I think that I've grown more and more on respect of the people on, on this board and the executive board. So, um, and I think Julia Mates is going to be a terrific addition to the um, executive board. So I just want to just uh, express my, my thanks and my appreciation. Well, Wayne, thank you for, for everything you've done with the executive committee and PCE. So I, uh, I, we will miss you, but uh, thank, and, uh, but, but again, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, Pradeep, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, Jeff, I just wanted to check. I, I have been on the executive committee, uh, uh, but I'm not a voting member. So I was just wondering, oh. uh, I'm not on the committee anymore. Oh, I'm, no, no, sorry, you're, you're still on. I, I, I limited this just to the voting members, but no, you and John are still, are still members of the committee and, and welcome to attend, so please. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I didn't mean, to, didn't mean to, to leave you off. Thank uh, you. Okay, and Rick DeGolia, go ahead. No, I, I think you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, I think that this executive committee has been an excellent committee. People have worked hard and um, we've worked really well together. Uh, Wayne has uh, stepped up, con although he's stepping down now per the slide, he's stepped up continually uh, to take responsibility and provide leadership and um, you will be missed, Wayne. Uh, I also want to note with Julia coming on the committee for the first time, we have a majority of women on the committee, which I'm very <laughs> proud of. You're right. I hadn't, I had not even, yes. Okay. It reflects the strong women, in, uh, you know, that are on this board. Yep. Okay. Um, I could take questions or comments or a motion to approve these nominations. I have Sir Mo. Second, Larry. Second. Okay, I have. Uh, was that Wayne making yeah. the motion? Okay, mm -hmm. moved. Lee seconded. May. Uh, Anne, roll call vote, please. Okay, if you would please announce yay or nay, yes or no, uh, in support or not supporting this motion. Uh, when I call your jurisdiction, County of San Mateo. Yes, Dave Pine. Yes, Carol Groom. Thank you. Town of Atherton. Yes, Rick DeGolia. City of Belmont. Yes, Julia Mates. City of Brisbane. City of Burlingame. Yes, Donna Colson. Town of Colma. Yes, John Goodwin. City of Daly City. Yes, Rod Dosnickwell. 
City of East Palo Alto. Uh, yes, Carlos Romero. City of Foster City. Yes, Catherine Mahampour. City of Half Moon Bay. Yes, Harvey Rarbeck. Town of Hillsboro. Yes, Larry May. City of Menlo Park. City, sorry, City of Mill. City of Millbrae. Yes. City of Pacifica. Yes, Deirdre Martin. Town of Portola Valley. Yes, Jeff Alves. City of Redwood City. City of San Bruno. Yes, Marty Medina. City of San Carlos. Yes, Laura Palmer Lohan. City of San Mateo. Yes, Rick Bonilla. City of South San Francisco. Yes, Floor Nicholas. Town of Woodside. Yes, Daniel Yost. Thank you, the motion passes. Hey, thank you, uh, Julia, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to thank you, Jeff, and um, the rest of the board for your confidence. Um, I know I have big shoes to fill with regard to uh, Wayne and his um, contributions to the executive committee, but I'm looking forward to working with, with you all. Thank you. Well, thank you for stepping up and welcome aboard. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you all. And we will move on to item six, which is more appointments. And this is for the CAC. Uh, Kirsten? Uh, hi. Um, actually, I'd like to uh, pass this off to the members of the board of the uh, board committee that interviewed the CAC members. Yeah, um, this is Wayne Lee. I'll be uh, doing a presentation. Uh, be short and sweet. Um, we had many, many good um, applications, very enthusiastic. It was very difficult to make the decision. I'd like to thank my co-committee uh, um, members, Councilman Marty Medina and Supervisor Carol Groom, um, who took the time on a busy day to uh, do a couple interviews. It wasn't just one. We tried to make it more di as diverse as possible in terms of experience and, and jurisdiction. Um, and we, we were very pleased to uh, nominate uh, Karen Green, uh, Terry Gibbons, and Tim uh, Busick. And uh, interestingly, Tim Busick dropped Carl Charles Stone's name, <laughs> uh, but we, uh, we appointed him anyway. Wow, uh, okay. Yeah, so, but, oh, hey, Charles, I love you, you know that. So, <laughs> He's so, not here. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's our nomination. And uh, just uh, so again, I like to say I'm very pleased to have been a part of this uh, from the very beginning. Um, so you can blame me because I was involved with all the, all the different uh, interviews. Uh, if do. it doesn't go well. Thank you. Okay, uh, any questions for the committee? In that case, I could entertain a motion to approve the nominations. I make motion. We second. Who was that seconding? Uh, Donna, I'll second it. Okay, moved Lee, seconded Colson. Uh, any other comments? I just wanna, I really wanna thank uh, Carol, this is Donna. I wanna thank Carol and Wayne and um, who was the third person that was on? Uh, Mar uh, Marty was on that. Marty. Um, and, you know, you guys just, I did them last time. They take a lot of time and it, it's a very, um, you, you know, you really have to focus, pay attention, engage these people and sell the job. And you guys did a great job. These look like really great candidates. Yeah, I second that. Thank you for the work on that. Um, if there's no other discussion, then we'll uh, roll call vote, please. Wait, did I hear nominations? Did I get a motion? Yeah, I made, we made the motion to, okay. and, the nominate, and the motion roll, nomination. Roll call vote, please. I'm losing it, but okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I've, got, uh, I've got all of the jurisdiction names here. So if you would please announce yes or no, yay or nay, in support of the motion or not, when I announce your name. Dave Pine. Dave? Oh, well, uh, we may have lost Dave. Yeah, yes, oh, yes. There he is. Please, there he is. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Carol Groom. Yes. Rick DeGolia. Sorry, I'm unmuted. Yes. Yes. Julia Mates. Yes. Madison Davis. Donna Colston. Yes. John Goodwin. Yes. 
Roderick Dous Magbois. Yes. Carlos Romero. Yes. Catherine Monpour. Yes. Harvey Rohrbeck. Yes. Lawrence May. Yes. Catherine Carlton. Wayne Lee. Yes. Deidre Martin. Yes. Jeff Alps. Yes. Ian Bain. Marty Bedita. Medina. Yes. Laura Palmer Lohan. Yes. Rick Bonilla. Yes. Flora Nicholas. Yes. Daniel Yost. Yes. The motion passes. Great. Thank you all. Um, I look forward to meeting our new committee members next month. Uh, next up is item seven, uh, review of the budget in progress. Andy. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, come on. Come on. Really? The flowers are just starting to come out. Let's see, what should I mute? That's Daniel Yost. Sounded like Daniel, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Someone okay. was destroyed the garden. <laughs> get, a, get, a, get a picture of those flowers. <laughs> All right. So um, the, uh, we uh, have a budget schedule to, uh, with a target to uh, approve the budget before the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. Um, on May 11th, we presented a draft to the executive committee um, and the same day, a draft to the audit finance committee. Uh, tonight, we're obviously reviewing a draft with uh, you all. And uh, then the target is to review a second uh, version updated uh, version with comments uh, from the audit finance committee on the last May 11th meeting and any comments that you give tonight with the audit finance committee and then to pre present a final for the board's uh, review on the 25th. Um, the primary assumptions in the budget uh, that we have today are PG&E generation rates would increase by 2% uh, next January. Um, that's based on input from outside consultants um, that we have a PCIA uh, will increase by a cap of a half a cent on January 1, 2021. Um, I've talked about that at the last board meeting and this PCIA trigger that will be implemented for the last three months of this year with a significant increase. Um, energy prices are based on our latest ABV forecast, uh, which is in November. Um, those prices do not refl reflect the effects of COVID-19 uh, and the economy. So uh, they could be um, high or low, uh, but um, don't reflect any assumptions there. Um, we've also built in uh, for this particular year, uh, two PPA contracts starting up. Um, one is the new Mustang project would be expected to start on December 1 for 15 years and a new wind project expected to start this summer for seven years. Uh, and two, uh, several major programs, the DER resiliency program, um, which the board approved will ramp up, of which and we've assumed a $2 million cost in this fiscal year and significant expansion of other programs. Um, the electric vehicle program that was approved by this board, uh, we expect $5 million this particular fiscal year and another almost $1 million from the building electrification program, which you haven't yet uh, reviewed or approved, but we have it in the budget. Um, we presented uh, a, a budget to the, to the Audit Finance Committee that I wanna walk you through what we presented and how we got to where we are now. Um, the, uh, the budget, uh, three, there are several columns here. The first column is the approved budget for the current year we're in, ending June. The second column is our forecast for where we expected to be prior to COVID-19 impact. Um, and then a preliminary budget, which would have been in place before the COVID-19 impact. Um, so we were expecting already a 37 plus million dollar revenue decrease, um, mostly as a result of, of um, uh, PCIA changes. Um, and as you can see, although our forecast this year was, is 
higher than our budget, uh, $63 million almost of uh, net operating position, um, change in that position. Our forecast prior to the impact of COVID-19 was that we were, we expected to actually be close to break even um, as a result of some additional uh, lower revenues and higher costs, mostly in energy. Um, then we presented to the Audit Finance Committee what we expected or we're seeing as a result of COVID-19. Some of this information is a little bit older than what Jan presented earlier, um, but I wanted to show you what we presented to the Audit and Finance Committee. Um, this shows uh, March and early April of 2019 compared to March and, and the first three weeks of April uh, 2020. Um, you can see uh, at the very bottom of that table, total PCE was 4% um, down for that um, seven week period. Um, and then the green box at the bottom is the three weeks basically of April 2019 versus 2020 where we saw a 6% decrease in total PCI, PCE load, um, larger, uh, large increase in, or decrease in commercial industrial and a, a significant increase in the residential load. Um, we took that information and we, uh, we uh, once uh, we, we kind of mapped out what we thought might happen um, and presented to the Audit and Finance Committee, what we called at that point a mid case, um, that we were going expecting a shelter in place to um, have a come out of shelter in place in the September, August, September timeframe, have a rebound, and then a second shelter in place with another rebound, and overall longer term over the next few years, because we do a five year mapping, um, that uh, we would expect a 6% load reduction over the next several years. Um, compared to what we what our forecast would have been prior to that, um, so uh, included in those uh, along with that um, was were these assumptions that went into that draft budget we presented to the audit finance committee. So as I said, a sharp recovery in a second shelter in place, and then a second sharp recovery. Um, we uh, residential, which makes up about thirty nine percent of our total PCE load. We assumed a twelve percent increase through June and then a 3% increase over, again, relative to pre-COVID rates uh, load, um, a 3% increase and then a 1% increase for the next three years. Um, small and medium business, which is 29% of our load, um, that's in bold because that's the largest decrease, a 22% decrease through June, and then a 15% decrease, again, rel not, not relative to, not compounded, but relative to our pre-COVID load forecast, um, and then a slight, uh, slightly less than the um, following three years. Um, and then I'll skip to the total PCE load where we basically thought that that worked out to be a 9% decrease through June, 6% decrease for the next four years after that. Um, we presented that to the Autumn Finance Committee and that uh, shows this the added column here with the red arrow um, that there was a $7.1 million negative impact um, on the 2021 year uh, as a result of the assumptions we made with COVID. Um, and because of the assumptions we made with COVID, the, uh, since they impact the last two to three months of the year, uh, or several months of April, May, June, uh, there was a $3.6 million impact to our net position just in this fiscal year as well. So we went through all that with the Audit and Finance Committee um, and the consensus was from the committee, um, in fact, unanimous consent was that we sh were probably too optimistic um, in our forecast and that they, if their input was that we should be um, more uh, pessimistic about the impact of, of what's happening and the length of time. Um, so we revised our assumptions. Um, there are no sharp recovery periods assumed. Um, residential is not increased as much. Um, the biggest change is the small and medium business uh, where we've assumed a 30% decrease uh, uh, through June and then 25% decrease um, for one year, again, relative to pre-COVID 
and then a 20% decrease for the next three years there, thereafter. The input from the committee was that small, smaller, small businesses wouldn't have a fast recovery and that some or many of them might not uh, come back. Um, the impact of all that is a, on the total PC low at the bottom is a 13% decrease uh, relative to ju through June, and then a 10% decrease for one year, and an 8% decrease for three years after that. Um, this shows um, that in summary. Um, so our pre-COVID forecast for the 2021 year was 3.8 um, million gigawatts, all right, three, and um, and uh, now we're projecting a 13% uh, less um, uh, in, the for, in this coming year and then 10% and then 8% for the three years after uh, in that, uh, our projection period. This is a um, graphical view of that. Um, the gray line at the top is residential. Um, so a significant uptick uh, in the early months, then higher in the um, coming year, and then a drift down, and then a new normal over the next three years um, that is slightly above what our pre-COVID forecast was. And pre-COVID is the uh, peach line um, for each of the uh, other lines in comparison. Um, the most significant is the the yellow one, which is the small business load change, you can see a steep drop, um, then some uptick, and then um, some additional uptick in the following years, with, and an assumption of 20% less in those three years relative to the pre-COVID forecast. Um, this is a summary. Uh, a little slight, slightly more summarized than, than what I showed in the prior ones. Um, but uh, the uh, arrow column shows um, revenues of $215 million, so 61 or $62 million less than the forecast for this particular year. Our current year we're in, um, and an $8.5 million change, negative change in that position, so not a lot worse than what the pre-COVID forecast was, although revenues are less, um, our costs are also um, mostly, mit our co lower costs mostly mitigate that change. Um, I wanted to um, just draw attention to that at the bottom, um, that the first draft budget was down $3.6 million uh, in the current fiscal year, which is the last quarter here. The first draft budget was $7.1 million down or worst uh, in the coming year. Um, and then the revised budget um, really only has an additional $1.8 million net impact in the uh, proposed budget year for a total of $8.9 million differential. Uh, <clears throat> Andy, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sure. Wayne has his hand up. Wayne, did you want to ask a question here? No, I can wait. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no worries. Okay, go, go on, Andy. Sure. Um, other changes in this slide I want to point out. Um, uh, if you look at the far right column is the change from the new budget case, which is our revised budget for this present to this draft of this meeting. And by the way, these numbers are the first time the Audit Finance Committee has seen these as well, because this reflects their input. Um, you can see that uh, revenues are expected to be down $62 million. I'll show a little more detail on that on the next page. Uh, cost of energy is expected to be down um, by $7.5 million. Um, compensation is expected to be up some. Um, that's partly, uh, and I have a, some detailed slides we can go through each of these categories. That is largely due to the fact that we do have some additional headcount in the plan, um, but in addition, um, the 10 people that were hired in this current fiscal year weren't here all year long, so they don't, uh, the increase is not all in new heads. Um, the consultants and professional services I'll, deal, I'll talk about, which is $2 million, but the bulk of that is the new DER program. Um, marketing and noticing is an increased marketing program, plus some uh, uh, 
resiliency uh, um, grants. Uh, the community energy program um, is a $6 million increase. Um, you can see across from the left side that the budget for this year was $5 million and we're still behind on spending that. Um, but that's largely because of the delay in the um, electric vehicle infrastructure program um, that we, once we partnered with the CEC, uh, that took a lot, has taken a lot longer to get off the ground than we anticipated. And then the last row is everything else. Um, and there's about six to eight line items in that everything else, but it adds up to a $582,000 change. I have a few more slides and then I'll pause for questions. Um, this is a detailed view of revenues. Um, let me walk you through this. Um, the approved budget for the current year is 268 million. We expect to end the year at about 277 million. Um, uh, I've mentioned a few times to this board that one of the reasons we're above for this year is because uh, the PG&E rate increase back a year ago wasn't built into this budget. It was approved before the rate increase became effective. And the PCIA change that became effective on January 1 of this year, um, or sorry, in, in May of this year was budgeted in, in January. So we didn't have that impact. Um, the, um, so $62 million less or less revenue expected next year. You can see how that lays out. Um, the PCIA cap of a half cent in implemented on May 1 has an impact of $5 million in the current fiscal year. The PCIA trigger of 58% that'll be, that we expect to be implemented in the last three months of this year uh, has an impact of $16 million. Um, the PCIA cap that's expected to be implemented on January 1 of, of 2021, which has been delayed the last couple of years, is currently projected to have an $8 million impact. And the impact of COVID on our load has a $33 million impact on revenues. However, that is partially, in fact, largely offset by lower costs. Um, uh, but so the revenues by themselves are not the impact on um, net position. Um, this is a picture, uh, a projection of our budget for um, costs of energy. Um, you can see that the forecast for this year is 200 and almost nearly $205 million. And the budget uh, we're projecting is $197 million. Um, the biggest reduction is um, in net energy purchases of 5 million. Resource adequacy, uh, surprisingly, is expected to be higher. Um, and I apologize for these numbers don't add up because there's a couple of pieces missing, but the total is, is right. Um, but the resource adequacy is expected to be um, lower. Okay, so that's, I guess that's, it's lower. Sorry, resource adequacy is expected to be three and a half million dollars higher. Um, and that's um, largely because we're expecting higher prices for resource adequacy and also because our obligation to um, uh, buy resource adequacy is based on um, submitted requirements way uh, last year, way before the effects of COVID and the way and reflects, reflects uh, the effects of um, lower load. Um, I know we're having discussions and there are discussions with the CPUC about reflecting that lower load, but so far those have not been fruitful. Um, let's see. Um, so then there's a, actually, let me stop before I go through uh, 2020, uh, beyond 2021. Any questions so far? Wayne's got his hand up. Wayne, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so I just had a few questions um, on one concern. Um, I just wondered if, um, why did why is the middle um, mid proposition recommended um, based on what was the thinking behind that? Um, and because I, in my, it's, it's, it's just my own personal feelings, but I've always tried to take the most conservative approach that way if the worst case does happen, we're okay. 
Um, and if, uh, if it doesn't, then we have extra money to spend. Um, so I just yeah. wondering why. And then also, sure. where, oh, just out of curiosity, where did you get your data from? The data from, for what? For your figures, for you know, your forecast. Well, um, we, uh, for, well, first of all, let me answer the first question. Um, we, uh, we put three cases together, again, before the audit and finance, before the meeting with the audit and finance committee, we put three cases together. One was an optimistic case, one was a very uh, dire scenario, and we decided um, that it was overly dire um, and that we would take a mid-case, and the mid-case still had a, um, let me go back, um, sorry, right here, um, where we, uh, We've been we had been seeing um, PC uh, overall load drop by six percent um, through the first uh, uh, April period, um, and we took what was what was determined to be the mid case, and we dropped um, uh, used the PC load down nine percent for the for the rest of uh, April May June time frame, and six percent decrease for the next four years from pre COVID. So the impact. Of uh, of our load, uh, or the effects of COVID was nine percent in this in this quarter, and then six percent after that. Um, the audit finance committee um, came to the same conclusion you did, which is that we weren't being uh, that we were overly optimistic, and that we should be more pessimistic. So we um, took a um, deeper view of that, and so if you look at the bottom of this one, we instead of a nine percent decrease for the fourth quarter, we assume 13%, and instead of 6% for the down for the next four years, we assume 10% for a year and then 8% for the three years after that. So um, we did take a more pessimistic view than our mid case. So we're, at the moment, our budget is not based on the mid case. It is based on, we don't have a name, we call, we're calling it budget case, um, but um, it is more pessimistic than what we presented to the audit finance committee. Um, what, whether, whether it's pessimistic enough um, or pessim as pessimistic as this board would like us to be, that's the purpose of this meeting is to go through what we've done um, and our rationale and to the extent that this board wants us to be, um, to, to take a more conservative or more pessimistic view, we, we, we can do that. Um, the second question you asked, where did our data come from? Um, <laughs> the, the forecasts are based upon a lot of input. We, we have looked at um, government uh, forecasts. We looked at um, economic forecasts. We looked at, uh, we read the paper um, and we used our gut and um, there's no, nobody that's able to, to predict what's going to happen. And so we took all those things into um, consideration and came up with what we thought was uh, reasonable. And as I said, the audit and finance committee told us to be more pessimistic and didn't, wasn't, wasn't um, uh, specific about that, but we tried to be, um, uh, tried to take a, mid, uh, a ground where we thought we um, uh, adjusted to their, to the input provided at the same time, not be, um, not have a doomsday forecast. Well, I really appreciate uh, you and the committee putting this together. I know it's not easy to come up with that data. Um, we're in a whole new world. Um, things are not normal and not going to be normal for some time. Um, and we on uh, ABAG has been trying to convey that to the staff there at the same time. Um, so I really appreciate what you're doing. And um, I'm just, uh, what was this there? I lost the train of thought. I'll come back. <laughs> okay. Uh, Donna's got her hand up. Donna, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so the comment that I was just going to make is, um, I think where we were trying to get at was not necessarily to have a pessimistic, pessimistic case, but we were really working to have a realistic case. And when Andy and the team really originally put the numbers together, it was really at the beginning of the month, we had only been in 
shelter in place for about three weeks, you know, two to three weeks when they started this process. I think we all came to it um, with our own city budgets in mind and how we were making adjustments and thinking about the length of the recovery and um, the sort of depth of, of impact on the businesses and especially that small and mid-sized business of which restaurants and a variety of other places, I don't think we really realized early on just how impactful it would be and how long it might take for them to get back online and meet the state standards. So what we really tried to do is not create this pessimistic case. We really tried to create a realistic case um, because the goal with budgeting is um, not to under project. And I mean, you know, your own personal budget, you might want to under project, but with a business budget, what you really want to do is try to hit it right on target. This is above and below why those variances existed and understand if those are one time or they're structural and permanent. So I think for now, this is a good approach. My strong suggestion would be that we re look at the budget in six months. You know, we're doing a quarterly report. You probably saw it in your um, uh, um, consent calendar, consent item agenda. Uh, so we're gonna be giving that monthly now to everyone. So you'll have that. And then in six months, you know, we could take another look at it and, and just see if we're close or not. And we can always present a revised budget um, that reflects any changes, a, a relapse, a reclosure, uh, opening more quickly, you know, any of those things could be accommodated at that point. Yep, and um, I, I guess I w also wanna be um, the uh, cl clear, I think one of uh, the questions that would resonate with some of the board members is whether we should be thinking about layoffs. Um, we're in a business that is uh, pretty, pretty um, relatively stable, even with deep discounts uh, or deep impacts to the economy that um, electricity, while it has pretty been changed and reduced, it doesn't, hasn't been reduced as much as other things. Um, and we also, other than the next few months where, we're, um, where we have significant hedges and we already locked in uh, purchases of some amount of energy beyond that initial period, um, if revenues go down, um, costs, are, costs also go down mostly. Um, and while they don't go down quite as much, the impact of reductions or a, a, worse, and a worse economy than what we projected um, are mostly mitigated by lower costs as well. Um, so because our costs are somewhat flexible, if we were, um, if we were farther down the road as a company um, and had already signed up uh, many more PPAs so that more of our load was already contracted for, um, we would have less flexibility to reduce costs because the costs would already be locked in. But in our case, um, a lot, since we're still early in developing and buying uh, energy and contracting for PPAs, we're still um, in, in, a lar in significant amount re uh, subject to the marketplace, um, which is both good and bad. And, and when revenues go down, we also have lower costs and can benefit from that. Uh, Laura's got her hand up. Laura, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that uh, presentation. And Donna, thank you for providing a framework for how we can think about this from a, a financial management practices perspective. So Andy, you uh, kind of made a comment that made me wonder, um, do, does, does the financial um, policy include um, a statement with respect to what we're supposed to keep in reserves? And then the second part of the question is, given what you said about overall costs going down as demand goes down for the most part, have you explored any other sensitivity? So in other words, we have a number of marketing programs to try to drive the usage of electric, um, of elect, you know, like the electrical vehicle program, those types of things. Um, Given the fact that consumer de demand will will likely be down, so for example, car sales, right? Demand for car sales, I read, are way down. 
would we consider maybe scaling back on some of these other programs that drive demand as a way to um, manage, you know, manage the budget, so to speak? Uh, uh, it's a good question. We have not uh, had those discussions about reducing programs more, although we did, we did go through an effort uh, before we presented these budgets to reduce the programs to this level. Um, so this, the proposed levels here are less than um, what the programs team actually presented. But before I fully answer your question, let me go a couple of slides forward because I think it provides some con additional context around your question. Um, um, so this picture, well, this one is the, the a view of the five-year plan based upon our current assumptions. Um, so the proposed budget, you can see at the uh, with the arrow here is net, change in that position of eight and a half million negative. Um, and then roughly five million negative and five million negative. And then it actually is somewhat positive, although not as negative or positive as we have been seeing um, in past years. Um, this also reflects really no real change in our um, operating model and our programs. And you, at about two thirds of the way down, you see community energy programs of $8 million and then 11 million and 13 million. Um, and at the bo very bottom, um, you can see an unrestricted cash days on hand. Uh, our, our reserve policy requires us to have 180 days um, and even with these um, spending levels of community energy programs and continuing to make an investment in those um, over the next five years, along with no other real fundamental changes in the way we operate our business, um, we, it looks like we can, uh, our projection is that we will still be well above our unrestricted days cash on hand. Um, and in fact, let me go to one more page to, to make some observations. I've skipped a little bit of the detail, but let me tell you my overall observations, which I think provides context for you. Um, so with the COVID-19 likely to have significant impact on revenues, um, $32 million uh, less in the coming fiscal year budget that we proposed, um, and an average of 22 and a half million less over the following four years. Um, however, uh, number two, our cost of energy is expected to be $23 million lower um, in the coming fiscal year. So really only a $9 million differential, um, even with the more pessimistic um, uh, budget and, and revenue forecast. Um, and the cost of energy is expected to be $18.9 million less over the following years, four years. So 80% of the decline in revenue is, is offset by declines in costs. Um, so, and the following uh, number three is an average of $5 million a year impact and that position um, is, is our impact, our expected impact over the next following four years and a decline of $8.9 million. So um, I apologize, my number four there is, is pretty small, but um, number four uh, summarizes the impact is that we expect to still have our, our, the fact that we have significant cash reserves um, today enables us ability to weather a pretty significant downturn for a very, for quite a while and still maintain cash reserves well above our required level and still continue to invest in community grants and energy programs as we've currently got them planned. Um, although we, it, that, that is up, up to this board, whether we, um, would cut those back or reduce those. And I'm sure that we will go through a process internally to um, evaluate whether those programs make sense to continue. Great. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Uh, Rick has got his hand up and then Carlos. Yeah, I just wanted to comment that uh, the adverse impact of the load reduction from COVID-19 is about equal to the adverse impact from the increase in the PCIA. They each represent about 50% of the reduced revenue, or if I understand it right. Um, 
uh, and I know there's a cost impact on on, on uh, the COVID uh, revenue reduction, but those numbers are pretty close. And uh, we've got to do something about the PCIA in this coming year. Yeah, fair, fair point. Yeah. Carlos, go ahead. Yeah, that was gonna be precisely my point. And I, I know I had made a mental note to actually have a long conversation with Pradeep about PCIA, but yeah, I, I would completely concur with Rick that in our discussion um, in the Finance Committee, we did point to the fact that the PCIA is something we really have to think about and figure out how we can control it, or at least legislatively, or in, and then if not, really plan, because it, it does take a big chunk out of um, our net earnings. Thanks. Yep, yeah, noted. Uh, Andy, do you, did you have, uh, go ahead, Andy, keep, or keep going. Uh, well, um, the, the rest of the slides are dig into each of the areas, provide more context and detail around each of the areas, for example, compensation and energy programs and all those, are, but, I, but I don't need to dive into those unless there are need to dive into them. Okay, uh, any other questions for Andy on the budget? Uh, and Jeff, but one the one thing I guess I'd like is um, from this from the board is whether there uh, we we still this is still a um, not final we still need to update for current information and we will put together a final version for the audit finance committee to review in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, but if there's other input or direction that this board wants to give uh, to us before we finalize those budget. Uh, that budget, I, that would be useful. And if not, then this is at least acceptable to continue to move forward. That would be good to know as well. Okay. So yeah, we're not taking an action, but if there is guidance from any commentary from the board, uh, now would be a great time. Anyone care to questions or comments for Andy or the staff? Rick Bonilla, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. I just want to say thank you to uh, Andy. Let me start my video there. Um, thank, oh, I can't. Thank you to Andy. And um, I think this budget, while it's very realistic and presents, I think, a good, uh, accurate picture of uh, current and possible future conditions, I think he's done a good job of showing that we do have a path forward. Um, clearly, we have choices, but I don't feel as though. Um, I think we're in a better position than a lot of businesses out there for sure. Um, energy is not going to go away. So um, I'm optimistic. Uh, I heard the word pessimistic a lot, but I tend to be optimistic. I always see the glass half full. So thank you very much. Those are my comments. Thank you, Rick. You know, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, we, we spent a lot of time, you know, we spent these last years building this reserve uh, specifically so we'd weather situations like this. Um, you know, we should do everything we can, especially around the PCIA, but uh, I think we will get through this. And I think this is actually an opportunity for us to continue. Some of our program investing will probably drop just because demand for, you know, if some of our program money becomes sort of subsidies for products, then that demand might drop if, if the economy is, is really bad. But I actually think this is, is an opportunity for us. I, I think we will weather this financially and this is an opportunity for us to actually continue to promote our mission, which is, which is increasing, you know, which is, is cutting into greenhouse gas emissions any way we can, including through replacing uh, fossil fuel burning appliances and vehicles. So I'm, I'm also optimistic, but I, I think, um, you know, we talked a lot of finance about the assumptions and the modeling going into this. And I think we struck a, a note that's conservative, but but still within the realm of realm of reality. So um, I don't have any further comments. Uh, if there are no other comments, then we can move on. Thank you. So this gets us to item nine, which is uh, sorry, item eight, uh, which is approving the PG&E allocations. Uh, Jan? Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, 
Thank you all. Um, we have finally gotten our allocation from PG&E, and so we wanted to um, bring this back to you. We reviewed this with the board in January, and, um, and also we reviewed this with the executive committee on May 11th. We ran out of time for a full discussion, and so in this presentation today, there are updates to the slides um, that have occurred since then, which are gonna be highlighted in red. Um, we brought this to the board in January, and at that time, we had estimates that we shared with you and made a recommendation based on that information. And it was also agreed that we would bring this back to the board once we had received the actual allocation from PG&E to get your final approval. Since that time, a number of things have changed and some in a very big way. So uh, we are not saying that we didn't hear what you said in January, but we're asking you to take another look today because there have been a lot of big changes um, since that time. So let's see if we can go to the next slide, please. So what we'll do uh, today is just go over the background, the schedule, uh, COVID-19 impacts, the GHG free targets, cost impact market research, what other CCAs are doing in our recommendation. So next slide, just as background, um, as you know, PG&E owns or contracts for GHG free energy, including large hydro and nuclear. And in 2018, 13% of their supply was from large hydro and 34% was from nuclear. Um, they count these resources to meet their GHG free targets all CCA customers pay for these resources through the PCIA. And up until now, we have not been able to claim or count these resources for ourselves. And um, over the longer term, this is going to be addressed through the PCIA proceeding starting in 2021. Next. So for the interim, namely for the year 2020, um, there's an interim approach with PG&E in that they are allocating their large hydro and nuclear to all load serving entities based on a load ratio share. And basically what is for our share, it's what percent we are of PG&E's overall load. And we have the option to accept each resource allocation separately. So we can accept the large hydro and not the nuclear, or we can accept the nuclear and not the large hydro, or we can accept both, or we can accept neither. And this is based on the actual generation and if we reject the resource it doesn't mean that we um, will impact the volumes that we receive for that those that we accept we have 30 days to accept the allocation and let's go to the next slide so this is the schedule and in red i've updated what's what's new um, on may 7th the pc the puc approved pg &E's advice letter that they had filed back in december asking to do this allocation. So we had brought this to you in January, expecting that that allocation would be uh, done quickly and that the, PG, that the PUC would uh, approve it. Well, they didn't approve it until May. Um, PG&E offered our actual allocation on May 21st. So we got the letter from them and that was in your packet uh, showing what the percentages were for the different months of uh, our load compared to theirs. We have 30 days to accept it, which means by June 20th, we need to respond back to PG&E uh, to accept or reject any of those allocations. And then we have um, 15 days from then to execute a contract. So uh, based on board approval tonight, tomorrow we, uh, we can get back to PG&E and then we'd have 15 business days, which takes us to June 19th, which would be to execute the contract, and then we would expect pg and &E to start the deliveries probably around July 1st. Next slide. Um, we already went through this. Um, this was what we had showed the executive committee in uh, early May, this uh, mid-case scenario. And if we go to the next slide, um, as Andy just um, spoke to you about uh, a few minutes ago, we have changed the um, assumptions on what the load will be so that we're projecting a 13% decrease in the total PCE load through June 2021, and then a 10% decrease for the next year, and then an 8% decrease for the next three years after that. 
Next slide. So our forecast for the Eco Plus load, uh, back in January, um, we had expected the Eco Plus load, uh, which is where we need to, to procure the GHG free resources from, to be 333 three, three, three gigawatt hours. And now with a new projection, it's 3030. So it's gone down about 10% uh, or so with the impact of the COVID. Next slide. Also, the uh, delay in the PUC approving PG&E's advice letter has changed the amount of allocation we're expecting from them. So back in January, we had expected 300 gigawatt hours of large hydro and 700 of nuclear. The current estimate based on the letter they sent to us and our own internal calculations based on the uh, snowpack for this year and based on actually the 2018 nuclear volume is that uh, our total amount starting July 1 would be 156 gigawatt hours of large hydro and 421 gigawatt hours of nuclear. Next slide, please. And since, um, since January, we procured some additional greenhouse gas free uh, because at the time we expected that you know, our load was not going to be reduced. One of the contracts that we had for GHG free uh, turned out that we were not going to get because it was based on hydro and we were kind of second in line to receive um, that GHG free from that resource. So we needed to replace that. And um, also over time, because our load forecast has reduced the amount of renewables that are going to make up our total, um, our, our product mix for Eco Plus has, um, has increased. So we, we haven't increased the amount of renewables we've procured, but the percentage that it makes up of our total Eco Plus need has increased. So in January, we had procured 50% of our renewables for our 50% renewable, 95% GHG free Eco Plus product. Now with the reduced load forecast, those renewables will make up 60% of our Eco Plus and the uh, GHG free that we had procured in January made up 23% of our need, now it's 25%. So we have an open position now, only 10% of the GHG free as compared to the 22% that we uh, talked about in January. Next, please. So um, if we could put, uh, I'm gonna get a little nerdy here. In your um, board packet, there was a spreadsheet and I just want to walk through that with you so that you understand the numbers. And uh, Andy, if you can get that spreadsheet up here. If we can somehow make that bigger. Okay, so we'll start here at the, uh, at the top. So basically in uh, row three uh, shows our total PCE load. So back in January, we were, thank you, we were projecting 3.6 uh, million megawatt hour need and the eco plus portion of that, which is the next line down, was gonna be 3.336 million. Oh, there's some kind of echo going on here. Okay. You go down to the next. Mute or unmute yourself by pressing. You are unmuted. If whoever's unmuted can mute their phone. Thank you. So, um, looking at line, f the next line down. If you could highlight that, please, Andy. The next one up, up one. Okay. So back in January, we expected we needed 3.336 million megawatt hours for Eco Plus, and now if we look in column E which is our current load projection, we need 3.030 uh, for Eco Plus. So what we do to figure out how much do we need to procure, we take 50% of that Eco Plus load to determine um, the renewables portion, and that's in line seven. And then we add to that the Eco 100 load, which is 100% renewable, and that shows us what our total renewables needed are, which is line nine, or row nine, yeah. 
So back in January, we projected a need of 1.933 of renewables. Um, at the time, actually, we were slightly over. We we're at 1.940. Um, so we, we were like pretty close. But now because we have reduced load, um, the total amount of renewables we need to make up the 50% is now only 1.7 million, but we have already procured 1.9 million. So we have excess renewables of 215,000 that we can apply to our GHG free need because those renewables are GHG free, free. So then we go back to figure out, okay, how much of our GHG free do we need? We take that eco plus load that was in line four, we multiply that by 45%. That brings us down to line 13 to show what we need for GHG free needed. Uh, line 15 shows what we've procured to date. So back in January, we had procured 658,000. Since then, we've procured a little bit more, as I explained earlier. So we currently have 834,000 megawatt hours of GHG free. If we add to that the excess renewables that we have, that then shows us what um, our open position is, how much more GHG free open, uh, GHG free resources do we need? So basically we take that 1.363, subtract the 834, subtract the 215, and it leaves us 313,000 megawatt hours of, of GHG free resources that we need. So now in uh, lines 19 and 20, it shows what we're expecting from PG&E. So, um, we are, based on the percentage of their load that they gave to us in the letter, we are expecting 156,000 megawatt hours of the hydro and 421,000 megawatt hours of nuclear. So if we take only the hydro, um, the 156,000, we subtract that from the 313, that gets us to 157,000 of uh, open position, um, a GHG free open position still. This is compared to what we expected back in January, which was 536,000 of open GHG uh, resources. The other thing that's changed is that the cost for GHG free has dropped. Um, because of these allocations, there's less demand in the market for these. And what we were expecting was going to cost us $8 in, in January. Uh, we now know we could get for actually $3.15 now in May. And so the cost to fill this open position, if we only take the hydro, is about $500,000 as opposed to the $4 million that we were projecting in uh, January. And actually, I think in the, in the memo or the, the slides that we went through in January, we, we put it more at $5 million. So it's decreased significantly. Um, and then if we were to take both the hydro and the nuclear, we would actually be over procured by 264,000. And so we don't need to be over procured because we would, there's actually no one who would buy the excess uh, nuclear. So um, I think if we go to the next slide, if we go back to the slides, we can kind of, I hope I haven't totally um, confused everyone with the numbers, but I just wanted to go through that for you to, so you can understand. So basically this is kind of a summary, um, the, the change in the load, how much renewable energy we procured, what our greenhouse free, GHG free procured is, our open position, how much would be open after the hydro, the assumed price if we were to, um, fill that, that open position from the market and the difference. So basically, uh, you know, those bullets on the right, due to the decreases in load and more renewable generation than expected, our GHG free open position is smaller than January. The costs for the GHG free resources have decreased signif significantly. They continue to fall. Um, it was estimated that the cost or actually the reduced savings to PCE of not accepting the nuclear was five and a half million. And at this time, we believe the reduced savings of not accepting the nuclear is tenfold less or around 500,000. We can go to the next slide. 
So um, because there was a lot of discussion about this in January, we um, did a small market research survey and I'm going to ask KJ to jump in here to um, go over this with you and, and what we learned from this. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so what we did in, in uh, late January, early February um, was to take a look at what we what we could find out about how our customers might react to having nuclear in the mix. And so what we did was uh, we did an online survey uh, that was in English only of a sample of our residential customers. And we were targeting about 300 completes. And the reason for that is that we wanted to have a 90% confidence interval, interval around the results, uh, plus or minus margin of error of 5%. We ended up getting 350 completes. Uh, the survey was fielded in the middle of February. Next slide, please. And what we did is in order to present this information in the least biased way possible, we presented them with what was essentially a power content label. And we labeled the, the options, option Q and option R, and we asked a question of, if you had the choice between options Q and R with no difference in cost, which would you prefer or do you not have a preference? And as you can see, we highlighted the two areas that were different between the PCL option Q and the PCL option R. And they are that under Q, there would be 27% large hydro and 18% nuclear. Under option R, there would be no nuclear, but there would be more hydro. Uh, and so we asked people, which would they prefer? Next slide, please. And these were the results. Um, the majority, as you can see, 62% preferred the option without nuclear. 23% preferred the option with nuclear. Um, and uh, we then asked several additional questions about that. And we asked an open-ended question about why did you select the choice that you selected? Again, we didn't want to provide a whole bunch of you know, reasons and presuppose what people would say. Uh, so we asked them why, and then we also wanted to gauge the intensity of their uh, feelings and their perceptions uh, of, of based upon their choices. So we also asked them further, if you found that your, nuclear, that your energy mix delivered to your household uh, had an 18% nuclear, what would you do? What actions would you take? And then we also asked them, how might that change uh, their perception of their energy provider if, it's, if it had 18% nuclear? Next slide, please. So the reasons for the preferences were um, not surprising on those who chose the nuclear free option. The main reasons why they didn't want nuclear were risk concerns, concerns about disposal of waste, uh, concerns about the danger of a meltdown, uh, and those percentages indicate the percent of the respondents who gave those uh, reasons for choosing that option. Those who preferred the option with nuclear, about half of those uh, saw it as a cleaner, cheaper, and more reliable source. And 16% of them selected the Wait. option with nuclear. Sorry, was there someone with a question? Oh, um, <laughs> I guess Dave, not. <laughs> Dave's got his hand up. Dave, did you want to ask a question? I suggest KJ keep going till okay. the end okay. we can, we'll, and then we'll, we'll have we'll take questions. End, okay, yeah. all right. So 16% of them gave the reason of choosing the one with nuclear because they saw that that option had more large hydro in it and they were opposed to having more large hydro because of the damage to the ecosystem. Next slide, please. Uh, so then we asked them uh, what, what actions might you take if you discovered that your um, the energy delivered to you had nuclear in the mix. And this, this was a list of responses. We gave them uh, a choice of responses as well as an open-ended uh, choice to, to fill in what they, what they might do, what action they might take. And three quarters of those who preferred the nuclear free option expressed an inclination to take some kind of action. Uh, and so you can see what, what some of those actions are. Uh, the ones that I thought were the most pertinent here um, were things like uh, comment on the change via social media, 19%, um, contact an elected official, 16%, uh, 
those kinds of things. Some of them were rather constructive options, like you know, shop for an option that doesn't use nuclear, et cetera. Um, we did also ask them, as I indicated earlier, um, how that might change their perception of the energy uh, supplier, and two in five felt that that would negatively impact their perception. And I think that's all we had to present at this point. Questions? Uh, Dave, go ahead. Um, sure. Um, if we could go back, this would be for Jan. I don't know if we could get the um, spreadsheet back up. Uh, or maybe it's not that important. I can ask it without it. Well, first off, Jan, thanks for um, walking us through all, all this. And, you know, so. so Actually, I'm, I'm not done. Um, we have a couple oh. more slides. I don't know if it makes sense to finish that up and then and then we can take it. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay. okay, I think we just got, we have two more to go. So next slide, please. I have a quick question. This is Julia. I have a quick question regarding the survey. Can I ask that now or do we, are we still gonna talk about that? Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so were there any questions or was there anything on the survey that, um, uh, told the those being surveyed um, about the uh, economics. No, um, uh, interesting question. We specifically only asked them what their reaction was to having nu having nuclear in the mix that was offered to them, and we told them there was no difference in price between those two options for them. But we didn't go into any details about the impact on Peninsula Clean Energy's financials. Thank you. Um, Donna, okay. go ahead and ask a question now if you want. Thank you. Mine also then is the follow on to Julia's, which is, you know, that seems to me to be a massive flaw in the survey because um, if you look at the uh, page 105, I think, of our report where we have the um, opt up rates. Um, only, you know, I know in Burlingame only fewer than 3% of the people have opted up, even though they could get a fully 100%, you know, greenhouse gas free and renewable portfolio. And when you look at that, that means 97% of the people won't opt up. And when I talk to people, it always has to do with the cost. And so to leave the cost out of this discussion really flaws the results as far as I'm concerned, because just by looking at the difference between Eco Plus and Eco 100 tells you the, the, throughout the whole county um, that 97% of the people are willing to take some, you know, non greenhouse, you know, the lower greenhouse gas free and the lower renewable in those portfolios. And, and the only differentiating factor is cost. So to leave that out is, to me, a big flaw in the survey. I think that's an interesting point. And I, I, it, it, were we planning to reduce the price of Eco Plus if we took the nuclear? Because then that would be, I would agree with you that that would be a serious flaw because the offering we were giving to the customer no, would no, not because, that. Well, the, 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 I, think, I think the question is, it may or may not relate to, to that. What I'm focusing on more is when you give, if you said to people, do you want Eco 100 or Eco Plus, and they cost, and you're, the cost is going to be the same, obviously people would pick the cleaner portfolio. So we have real data in our own customers that suggests that the minute you put a cost variable in it, people will make a different choice than the cleanest portfolio. So that's all I'm saying. So to me, um, even though their costs might not be different, um, it is to us. So, I mean, you know, there is, there is data out there that shows that, that, that there is a difference. And, and it is, whether we pass the cost along or not, there is a cost to us. I, I think that's an interesting point, Donna, but if you go to the, the slide before this one, please. When we asked them why they chose what they chose, it wasn't about the carbon emissions that, you know, provoked them. It was really about the, for those who chose the nuclear free option, it was about the perceived risk of nuclear in particular. So I think there might be a different sentiment about a PCL that includes nuclear versus one that Did, includes things that are not GHG free. Does the, um, I, I, I'm, what is, is our power content label that we have right now? 
um, is, sorry, the kitty's meowing. Um, the power content label that we have now and in the past between when we, the inception of PCE to now, we have never had nuclear in our portfolio. Is that what you're saying? That's right. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. All right. That, that clears, that helps clear that a little bit, but, and it makes me understand what, what we were worried about there. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So if we okay. can go to uh, a couple more this one, okay. Then the other was, uh, what are other CCAs doing? Um, so some are taking the nuclear, Silicon Valley clean energy is, San Jose is, Monterey is, um, although they're having some people question that. And then others that are rejecting it are East Bay, Sonoma, uh, Clean Power SF, and Marin. And then the last slide, please. So um, what we would like to recommend to you is that there have, and first there have been changes from January when we first brought this to you. Uh, the first is the delay in the allocation resulting in much smaller amounts than we initially expected. Mm -hmm. The second is our decreased load that uh, due to the COVID-19 that results in a reduced open position for GHG free energy. And then the price of the GHG free has dropped significantly since January, and we believe it will likely drop further. So there's also continued uncertainty on the impact of the COVID-19 on our load. So we're at this point in, in time in May, and we're forecasting what we think our load might be for the rest of the year, but it may be that our load will be even lower than what we're forecasting and that we would have an even less, an even smaller open position for the GHG free. Uh, the market research results provide more insight into how customers might respond to a changed power content label. So what we're recommending is that we accept the PG&E hydro allocation, we do not accept the PG&E nuclear allocation, and we wait and a few months to fill the open GHG free position if there continues to be one once we are more certain on what our actual load will be and as the prices of GHG free resources continue to drop. So um, we had projected back in that spreadsheet that if, um, if we only took the hydro and nothing changed um, that, we, that we might uh, have to spend 500,000 to fulfill the GHG free open position. And, and bear in mind again, that our overall uh, energy budget is 204 million. So this is a very small uh, impact on that. Um, and, it, and it actually that it's been budgeted in, it's in our budget already to have purchased these because that budget was put together before we knew this might even be a possibility. So this is just a savings or a reduction in our costs as opposed to a, uh, an increase in our costs. So, um, so that's what we're, we're recommending um, is that we, we just wait and take the hydro allocation, don't, don't take the nuclear at this point and then wait till the third quarter, like September, October, see where, how things look and then fulfill any open position that we have at that time if we need to. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, I know there are going to be a lot of opinions on this and I do promise everyone will be heard. Uh, just in the interest of Organizing this conversation, though, I would like to start with questions, just, just questions on, the, on any clarifications you need on the report, and then we'll move on to any public comment, and then we can have our full-blown discussion. So rather than get into a, a discussion right this minute, questions only first. So uh, Wayne, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make sure I didn't miss the point. We're, we're still paying if we choose the uh, non-nuclear options, we still have to pay for the privilege of of putting on our label that it's non-nuclear. I'm sorry, can you state that question oh, again? I just want to confirm that uh, in the past, I understood that if we, if we decided to have, uh, to keep the nuclear option, uh, I mean, to not have the nuclear uh, option on our, on our content label, then we would have to pay for that privilege. 
Uh, well, if we didn't take the nuclear, we would still have, have zero on our power content label. The cost doesn't, uh, it's in the PCIA, which our customers pay. So if we take it or we don't take it, the PCIA for our customers stays the same. If we, if we don't, Wayne, if we don't take the nuclear allocation from pg e it costs us approximately, right now we're estimating it costs us an extra half million to buy GHG free energy on the market to fulfill our GHG requirement. Um, so it costs us an extra half a million or so, might possibly less, and then we are, our, our Power content label says zero nuclear versus if we accept it, I think our PCL says something on the order of 12% nuclear and we, we save that 500,000. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Okay, pretty. I have a comment, so I'll pass on the question side. Okay, we'll come back to you. Dave. Um, thanks. Yes, I wanted to um, ask about, um, whether it, whether whether it would be possible to take the nuclear if we, took, if we took the nuclear and then um, any excess and we took the nuclear and the hydro but we kind of applied the nuclear to our needs and then had excess hydro couldn't we sell that excess hydro I understand we couldn't sell the excess nuclear in other words the way you the way you portrayed it is you would apply the hydro first, and therefore any nuclear we would if if we took the nuclear we would be over over uh, resource. But could you flip that around and use the uh, the nuclear first, then use the hydro and and sell off any excess hydro? Uh, yeah, we we could do that. That would then reduce the. I mean, we. We, we still need to make sure we have enough to meet our 45% uh, GHG free, but yes, we could sell the excess hydro and then the percentage of hydro that shows up on the power content label would be less and the amount of nuclear would be uh, correspondingly higher. Right. So the, the, you know, the pure economic analysis, there could potentially be more than a $500,000 benefit for PCE if, if you did that approach. I mean, I mean, there's many things to consider here, but you could, there's potentially more than $500,000 uh, that we could, uh, uh, that we could consider in this decision, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the amount of hydro that we're getting is 156,000 if we sold that off at at $3, um, that's 450,000. So it's not. Right, it's, it's still, it's, it's not, um, yeah, so. Well, like actually the open position would be uh, 264. So um, yeah, it would be 400, maybe 450,000 at today's prices for the hydro and zero for the nuclear because no one would buy that. But yeah, it's much less than the amount we had talked about back in January. Right, but, but you, you, see, you see what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. If there are, we haven't checked if people want to, uh, if there is a market for that. Okay, that's my technical question. Okay. okay. Uh, Deidre has a hand up. Jen, did you say that even if we had included the nuclear, it wouldn't be used? In our projections? Yeah. If we include the nuclear, yes, then we have more than we need. Uh, we'd have 264,000 megawatt hours more than we need. But, but if I could add, Deidre, that's why I just asked the question I needed again. I don't think, you know, we could use the nuclear first. You know, it's, it's up to us which, which resource we use first. Right, okay. Okay. Well, we we would have to sell off the um, all of the hydro that we got from PG&E plus some additional hydro that we've purchased from other entities. Right. Do we so we make money off of selling it? Uh, it sounds like a silly question. Yes. Well, we would we might make money off of the PG&E, but depending on what we paid for the other 
um, new other uh, hydro that's in our mix already, uh, we would probably not be able to sell it for the price that we purchased it because the prices are dropping. So we probably paid, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know all the details. It's possible that we would, we would take a loss on some of it. Okay. And I have one more question. Is that okay, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead. And this is more for sort of the general, and it may be maybe more of a statement, but um, uh, is this a topic where there could be, there could potentially be a conflict of interest in terms of people having investments for uh, nuclear or hydro? Uh, if, if, if a board member had a significant investment in a nuclear or hydro company or stock, then I, yes, they would, they would be, this would be the time to um, probably possibly recuse themselves from it. Yes. Yeah. So I would just like to make that request to the, to everyone. If they, if you know that you have a significant investment in your stocks and nuclear and or hydro, that it would, that would be a good time to recuse yourself. Mm, I just, just thinking randomly about the stuff we deal with. Thanks. Yep. Okay. If there are no more questions, right now, I will uh, ask for any public comment. Oh, okay. Rick, do you have a question or a? Yeah, I, I do. Sorry, I had my okay. hand up and then it came down. Okay. Um, two questions. So Jan, just to follow up on what Dave said, if I understood your presentation, which I thought was very thorough, uh, on your spreadsheet on row 18, it showed the excess renewables that we expect to have that we intend to apply against our GHG free option. And that's about 215,000 megawatts. Um, if we end up taking the hydro, we, we could probably sell that at the best price in terms of looking at what's in our portfolio and how we could generate any cash from the fact that we'll have excess GHG free power. Is that accurate? There are lots of combinations that we could do if we uh, accepted well, all of it. What, what, what are, what, so you had said that the GHG free rate was 325. What's the renewables rate? Um, it varies. I mean, I don't, well. you know, since, since our goal is to be 100% renewable, um we we weren't advocating to sell off more of the renewables uh, but i'm not uh, asking we, that i'm just asking what's the rate for renewables uh we it's probably around 15 dollars. oh boy okay okay second question was on uh where you showed what the other ccas are doing i I, I don't don't remember exactly what it said, but it basically said something like they intend to or they plan to. Has nobody actually taken a position on any of this yet? Oh, oh no, they have. Yeah, and um, yeah, it should say they, that CCAs who. Well, we this uh, slide was put together before we all got our allocations, but uh, for example, East Bay is going to reject the nuclear, and in fact they are um, reducing the amount of GHG free that they're going to have in their power content and focus instead just on the renewables. Um, they had a lot of, a lot of uh, public comment, a lot of uh, but, backlash but the from question, their community. The so. question is, is, are these decisions that have been made or are these things they plan to do? These are decisions that have been made. Okay. Okay, I see uh, Gladwin D'Souza has his hand up. Gladwin, go ahead. Good evening, members of the board, and, and thank you for letting me speak. I, have, I want to speak in support of the staff recommendations and make two points regarding the PCIA and marketing. So with regard to the PCA, I'm gonna make five points. 
First, Diablo is one third of the PCIA, the Diablo nuclear plant. The longer it's allowed to live, the longer we'll be stuck with the PCIA. About one third of the PCIA fees are due to the, just the cost of Diablo Energy, which has recently skyrocketed to $1.258 billion, according to a recent filing by the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility before the CPUC in October of 2019. Second point is that accepting the nuclear does not lower the cost of the PCIA. Closing the plant, on the other hand, would avoid the largest component of the escalating PCIA cost. Third, Diablo is a albatross for PG&E. It doesn't fit into the current energy dynamics in the state. We should allow it to drag them underwater and not help bail their sinking ship, aligning ourselves with Mayor Licardo's legislative amendment to SB 350. When solars could curtail the customer off-takers, help justify keeping Diablo alive. And the last point is align ourselves with CCAs in the north, which are relatively immune <coughs> from the PCIA, like MC, SC, Clean Power, San Francisco Valley, Clean Power, and East Bay Clean Power. The ones to the south that are taking the energy are, are basically being strangled by the PCIA. The two points I'm making on, on, the, on marketing is that taking the allocation undermines the mission of clean and carbon-free procurement. And we have a marketing opportunity here for the, on the power content label has, as has already been presented. So thank you for listening to my inputs. Thank you, Gladwin. Uh, Michael Clausson, uh, Michael Clausson, go ahead. Uh, good evening, board. Um, I'm Michael Clausson. I'm on the um, Citizens Advisory Committee, but I'm speaking just as a private citizen. Uh, I'm kind of shocked. Actually, all of your questions have been about the financial benefits or drawbacks, and not about <laughs> the fact of taking on nuclear power in Peninsula Clean Energy in the first place. And uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you don't express, have a personal concern about nuclear energy. And apparently very few of you are concerned about the, the public relations danger of taking on nuclear energy. And I have to tell you, since as we all know, a relatively small percentage of people really are aware of what Peninsula Clean Energy is, when this becomes public, and I'm sure some activists will definitely publicize this, this is definitely gonna help hurt the reputation of Peninsula Clean Energy. So, so I think that's a problem in addition to the, the lack of need to really take it on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, next up, uh, Drew, go ahead. Hello there, good evening. Uh, some of you may know me from other meetings. This is Drew, a Mid-Peninsula resident. So um, I'm less, a little less focused on nuclear versus non-nuclear in this discussion. I definitely have some thoughts on all that, but I'm sure the board does. But there's a couple points on the economics though that I just feel like I wanna second some board, quest board questions that were raised. And one is this whole thing about free or not free, the nuclear, the survey that was done, you know, it's not free. Like, even though the customer doesn't see it, it was a co it's a cost somewhere in the system. And it reduces the savings PCE, Peninsula Clean Energy would have. And it kind of reminds me of like the argument, well, it's free shipping on Amazon. No, it's not free shipping on Amazon. They just have the cost embedded in the items and stuff. So I just think I want to, that just being complete in the economic and that, to me should have potentially been part of it. I'm not advocating one way or the other in that comment, nuclear or not nuclear, it's just the completeness. And, and I also, when Director Pine brought up the question of kind of inverting nuclear first versus the hydro, it's, it's kind of similar in the sense that like, to me, it just needs to be kind of that more complete analysis. And then ultimately if the decision is to go one way or the other, that that's fine. I mean, that can be, uh, argued but the analysis shows because that hey this was covered so i kind of those are some costs and i appreciate board members were bringing those up and just the previous uh commenter on the line talked about the the reputation it's it's 
if there's a communication done on why this was and was cost savings and this isn't the long term, it may not be this detrimental. I have a friend who if I told him this, he would he'd have no problem with, with you making an economic decision. There's people like us that would understand. I'm not advocating one or the other, it's just we can understand it if it's explained. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, if there are no other public comments, then I will start taking board comments. Uh, Pradeep has been waiting, thank you, go ahead. Thank you, Jeff. I have uh, two points that I'd like to make. Uh, and I'm going to be not voting on it issue, but uh, I'd like to make strong recommendation to the board to consider those two points. The first point is that I think that every member of the board has very high responsibility to be fiscally responsible uh, to the community and the operations of the PCE. And even though $475,000 in the scheme of things doesn't seem that much compared to $5 million or more, but we should certainly think that that $475,000 came out from our rate payers. And we have already uh, designed our programs such as heat pump water heaters, and we want to subsidize those. So think about this way, that $475,000 could almost buy 100 heat pump water heaters completely free to, for our customers. Like we could actually buy and give them free. So it's not trivial as far as the customer programs go. Point number two, in terms of nuclear choice versus non-nuclear choice, whatever we decide in PCE to put on the label, nuclear content, GHG free, or we don't put nuclear content, it's not going to make any difference at all in terms of the energy production that is being provided in California. The nuclear operation will not stop, Diablo Canyon will not stop, but will continue until 2025. And our customers will continue to pay 4% of that operational cost, which includes operations, fuel, and investments for Diablo Canyon under PCIA. Whether we acknowledge its GHG free contribution to PCE mix or not, that operation will continue till 2025. I think our customers deserve the credit for what they have already, they are being forced to pay under PCIA. So my recommendation would be to be fiscally responsible, save those $475,000 to put some better use for that money, as well as look at it this way, that customers are paying for it. Why don't we let them have the credit? Thank you. Okay, thanks Pradeep. Rick, I, I, was, I was unclear uh, Prad, on Pradeep's recommendation. What, what was the, the final recommendation? I believe Pradeep is recommending that we accept both the, both the uh, uh, large hydro and nuclear allocations from PG&E. Oh, okay, thanks. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Rick Bonilla, go ahead. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Listen, um, I care about the promise that PCE has made to our rate payers, and that's the promise of 100% safe, clean, renewable energy. Safe being the main word there, okay? That's our promise, right? And economically, we made a promise that we would remain 5% below PG&E's rates. So um, regarding the PCIA, I support taking a legislative route to deal with that. Uh, I always have. I'm willing to go to work on that. I've already been working on it. Um, I think that's the way to go because I, it, it just is not right, okay? And so um, uh, I appreciate everybody's thoughts and so forth, but I do believe that we would be violating that initial promise of safe, clean, renewable energy. And there are concerns with nuclear. We've seen it before. We should not have the that feeling that a lot of people have about, oh yeah, that happened there, it happened then, it would never happen here. I don't believe that. So my position is supporting the staff recommendation. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Rick. Rick Degolia, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I feel fairly strongly on this issue. And just to start, I, I mean, I totally agree with what Rick Benia said about our commitment and our position. I, I don't make the judgment about, you know, safe and what, what is and what isn't. I don't have enough expertise. But uh, that judgment has been made, and I disagree with some of the government judgments that get made. Uh, and I would not vote to uh, create a Diablo Canyon today for a whole variety of reasons. But um, I don't think that we are talking about shutting Diablo Canyon down. The issue here, like Pradeep said, it's going to be generating. I think on this issue, the staff has taken a political position around this nuclear power and or ethical position if you prefer. But staff has made a judgment that they don't, that they think that there's a problem with nuclear power. And I could debate the issue about nuclear power. Uh, I have no interest in supporting Diablo Canyon. And like someone said uh, during this, call about a third, I think it was Gladwin, about a third of the PCIA goes to pay for the cost overruns at Diablo Canyon. Uh, but I've got a problem with focusing on the political issue here, because I think the this is about economics. And there's a $500,000 cost that we're talking about incurring if we don't accept this power. And in fact, the cost may be much greater than that because we could sell the power that we wouldn't need if we accepted this. And we, you know, Jan did a very thorough spreadsheet. It shows that there's both excess GHG free and renewables. And, and I'm not saying what we should do with that, but it's worth a lot more than $500,000. So, if we choose not to accept this nuclear power, we're choosing to spend money that we otherwise wouldn't need to spend. And the issue, I think, is not what the public perception would be of us if we were to accept the nuclear power that our customers have already paid for through the PCIA, but it's the perception of what people would say if we choose not to take $500,000 and put it to good use to benefit our customers. I think that's an irresponsible decision by the board, an irresponsible economic decision. And uh, I don't know exactly how much it's worth because I think the politics have confused it, but it looks like if we took this, we could get value for a significant amount of power that we could resell Plus, we wouldn't have to spend $500,000 for new power. And frankly, for me, it's not, it's not a big deal that this is $500,000, whereas in January, it was projected to be $5 million. The fact is, we're spending our customers' money on something that supports someone's political position, rather than spending that to benefit our customers, which we could do. Uh, and I think that's... That, that is the wrong thing. If, if in the survey that went out, it didn't just focus on nuclear, and I understand it focused on nuclear, and we got 350 complete responses, 220 of which uh, considered it a problem. I think the benefit of that survey was that those 220 people are absolutely perfect for us to market Eco 100 to because there, there's nobody that they're gonna get power from that doesn't have some nuclear mix, except Eco 100. And, uh, but the question that wasn't asked is how, that custom, how those customers would feel if we spent $500,000 on GHG free power when we could have spent the $500,000 for a, some kind of customer benefit, like buying the batteries that Pradeep referred to, but, whatever it might be. I think it's our responsibility to responsibly handle this money that's our customer's money and not to uh, uh, make a political decision, which 
is completely unnecessary and we're not prepared for because we don't have the background. We could, but we need Pradeep to be educating us. And, and the, we shouldn't be making that political decision now. So I think we absolutely should accept this power that we've already paid for through the PCIA. Okay, thank you, Rick. Kat, you're up next. Respectfully, I completely disagree. This is not a matter of politics. This is a matter of health and safety. And as was previously said, we're voting with our dollars uh, and what we, what we support and what we would like to see continue in terms of energy production. I don't care what the legal definition is. Nuclear power is not clean. It is anything but clean and it is dangerous. And I don't care if it costs just 100,000 or 500,000. It's the wrong thing to be, to be spending money on. It's wrong visually for us to be doing, it's wrong ethically for us to be doing. I'm, I'm completely against it, could not be more against it. Um, now I have a question for uh, our attorney who's on hand. Um, I'm kind of holding the Menlo Park City Council meeting hostage. They are taking a, uh, a break while I'm here to vote on this. Uh, is there any way I can vote on this now and get back to the Menlo Park City Council meeting or do I need to stay until this is continued? Uh, unfortunately, Kat, this is Jennifer. We need to wait until the matter is, there's a motion and there's a vote taken. Okay, do you need a second? Oh no, wait, the, the, the motion is for the other. Never mind. Um, all right, let's keep talking. I'll, I'll, I'll text uh, Min, the Menlo Park Mayor and tell her that uh, they need to keep waiting. I, I don't think there's a motion on the table. Not there yet. There's no motion. Okay, I move to, to uh, accept the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, there is a motion on the table, but we do need to discuss it further. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Kat, was that, was that, are you, is that everything you need, wanted to say? That's everything. Okay. Okay, Catherine Mahanpour is next, go ahead. Um, hi, yes, I, I agree with uh, Kat. And I don't, I don't look at nuclear as being renewable either. And I think that's one of our promises as well. Um, I don't see this as a political decision. I see it as an environmentally responsible decision. So I'm in favor of the staff report. Okay. Julia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so we voted on this in January and um, we voted to accept both the nuclear and the hydro. My position on this has not changed since then. Um, I agree with those who spoke before me regarding um, the fiscal responsibility we have with public funds. And I, I think I'm a little taken aback by some of the comments staff made uh, about our energy budget being $204 million, so $500,000 savings really isn't needed. Um, I think if, with regard to reputational risk, um, comments like that actually make it sound like we are woefully out of touch with what's happening right now. And given the fact that so many of our customers are in a position that of financial constraint and losing uh, jobs and businesses and things like that, $500,000 sounds like a lot of money. Uh, $204 million is an incredible amount of money. $500,000 actually happens to be the exact amount staff is recommending for item nine uh, for the portable batteries. So we could actually go ahead and put that money to, to that instead of uh, essentially wasting it. So I think we need to um, really consider that. I also think we need to keep this reputational risk um, threat in check. Um, when we voted on this in January, you'll remember some of the discussion was, this will be in the papers, it'll be in the op, you know, op-ed. Um, it's been five months and that hasn't happened. Um, in fact, I did talk to some of um, our, our constituents and um, many of them understood, um, which I think is to Drew's point, that uh, sometimes when you're um, you know, uh, shepherding uh, public funds, you need to make sure that you're, you're uh, doing the right thing. And as a board, that's what we decided to do. And so I think, um, you know, that's something that we need to consider. So far, five months later, there's been no real huge reputational risk uh, uh, consequences that we've seen. The other thing that I wanted to bring up um, 
is the survey. I really wish that the board had been uh, alerted to the fact that staff was going to do a survey. Um, sounds like it was done after uh, the board already decided to go ahead and accept both allocations. Um, so I think if we had been able to look at the questions and uh, consider maybe, you know, uh, adding some, talking a little bit about the economics, I think we would have been able to uh, you know, get a survey that we would have all been more comfortable with. And I'm actually taken aback at the fact that staff, I don't, and maybe staff did ask the, the executive board, I don't know, but I certainly hadn't been aware that there was a survey being given. I understand that we do surveys, but I, I don't think staff has ever done a survey before without um, at least the board being aware of it. And so um, I, I really appreciate the next time that happens, that the board is aware that, that staff is going to the public um, with something like this so that we can discuss it, um, especially after we've made a decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Dave Pine. Okay, well, you know, we've um, had this debate a couple of times and I think uh, other CCAs have had probably the exact same debate. We've seen different people come out different places. So, you know, um, it's just one of those issues where, you know, uh, Reasonable people can have different different opinions. So just kind of summarize the way I kind of look at it. You know, first off, you know, we're not talking about creating any new nuclear energy. I think everybody understands that. You know, we're, we're not, no one's going out and, and, and generating new power for us. This is power that already generated and we've already paid for. So there's really three, I think there's three, three, three things that people have to think about. And, and people think differently about these things, at least, at least two of the three. So one is, what's the economic impact to Peninsula Clean Energy? And I think it's pretty hard to debate that, that, that taking the hydro and the nuclear would be a good thing for our financial picture. It would be at least 500,000, maybe quite a bit more if we sold off excess hydro. That is ratepayer money and we could put it to good use. I, I think that's a hard one to, to I, I, think that's a hard, I think that was actually factual. And the next issue is reputational risk. That's where people are gonna disagree. What will, the reputational risk, um, we will find out if that's an issue when the power content label is published um, next year. Um, I personally think that they'll, it will gener some people will notice their, their power content label and there'll be some calls. I, I don't personally think there's a, a significant reputational risk. And then the third prong, and this is the one that you can feel, you can hear in a lot of people's voices, and, and I understand it, is just philosophically, you know, the word nuclear is a really loaded word. And, you know, some people uh, in this room, and I respect it, just don't want any association with nuclear at all, period. So anyway, those are kind of the three lenses to look at it. Through and for for me, I, I'm 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 convinced that the economic lens is the important one, and that's why I'm gonna. I don't want to. I can't support the staff recommendation. Okay, uh, Laura Palmer Lohan, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I think that this issue is not a one um, one dimensional issue. I think it is multi dimensionally uh, a multi dimensional issue. Yes, there is an economic component to it um, for sure in terms of dollars and cents. And I think uh, Supervisor Pine, you made an excellent point with respect to the fact that you know that is you know the probably sole fact uh, that we have here. Um, the safety issue is also something uh, that was raised and as a, um, you know, as vice mayor of San Carlos, I, and not to mention this COVID-19 response, the whole, whole focus has really been on safety of our broader community. And it is not lost on me that uh, the nuclear energy um, programs are, you know, being quietly shut down along the coast. Um, uh, and in many places across the globe. And uh, I believe that that, uh, I believe you know, that, uh, that, uh, that a, a failure is still a possibility. And, um, and I think the, the 
uh, goodwill um, risk and the reputational risk that was pointed out was not, uh, you know, put in jeopardy at the last vote. I think that has to be tempered with the fact that it was made clear at that time that there would be another vote. This would come back before the board at that time. Um, given the fact that this is the vote in which uh, it will lead to a publication in our label and is, uh, I think, more of a hard action, um, I think that it is a higher likelihood that that will be an issue this time around. And what I also hear is really around values. Um, people are, are uh, like you said, uh, Supervisor Pine, you know, passionate about this, and it's, I think that's values-based. So um, taking you know, all of those things in consideration, you know, ultimately there is a cost to the decisions that we make. And while one is you know, dollars and cents on a piece of paper, um, there's also a price that I think we need to attribute to our goodwill and our political perspective. So I, um, I plan to vote um, in favor of staff recommendations on this item tonight. And I encourage all of us to look at this holistically and not just from one dimension. Okay, thank you, Laura. Deidre, you're up next. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just a few comments. Uh, I think that we actually are being fiscally responsible. I appreciate staff bringing this back to us because we're having a different discussion now. Back in January, it was a uh, $4 million savings, and, and now we're looking at a $500,000 savings. Um, so, and I think we have about 200 million in reserves. Um, I appreciate um, Julia's comments on, you know, the, the economic status of a lot of our folks, but to us, we have plenty of money to um, for our customer programs, it's not been an issue. So I think we are being fiscally responsible. COVID-19 is obviously not really making a dent in our reserves. Um, so I think with this new discussion uh, and it, that the, the, the point about um, it becoming political, well, well, we are all politicians. Of, of course it's political. Uh, and I understand that staff is not supposed to take a political stance, but the only reason that many of us ran was to take a stance for the environment in the political arena. I can tell you for sure that the city of Pacifica um, that I represent, that I was born from uh, of the climate committee would uh, seriously question um, uh, the reputation of Peninsula Clean Energy, absolutely. Um, if, if we were to include uh, nuclear. And um, I also want to acknowledge that the Community Advisory Committee, thank you for having that discussion, unanimously rejects um, the nuclear. Uh, and um, I also appreciate that staff went out and did a survey and did what I consider is their job as um, subject matter experts in marketing to go out and get surveys. So thank you for doing that. I will uh, be voting in favor of staff recommendations this evening. Um, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, Deidre. Uh, Carol, did you have your hand up to talk or? Um, you're, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, Donna, you can go after Carol, okay? Wait, you're muted again. There you go. That? There you go. Um, thank you. I, 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 I'm woefully inadequate in finding the, the button to say speaker, but so thank you for calling on me. I mean, I re, we, when we had this conversation earlier, I think there was a whole bunch of us that were torn, kind of in the middle. We, we, we weren't sure about either solution. And I've been doing a lot of thinking of, uh, ever since, since our meeting in January. And I'm, I'm going to accept the staff's recommendation and say that the, our community would probably not appreciate a nuclear allocation. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Donna, go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, so the, I think that the points on both sides have been made well. Um, my tendency is to um, obviously focus on a lot of the economics around it, but I also want to point out that 
I don't think we want to have this discussion every single year because the PCIA is going to continue to give us um, an allocation if the process works as it did this year um, and we're paying for it, they're going to give it to us and it will most likely have nuclear and large hydro in it next year. So I think whatever we decide, the policy should probably just be the policy. Um, and I don't know if you, you know, or you need to think about this. Do we want to debate this every single year? So if next year it were $20 million and nuclear versus 500,000, would that make a difference to people? And I know for some people it will, and maybe some people it won't. But that's my concern is right now 500,000 seems like a very small amount of money, but next year it could be a lot larger. Um, it could be even more the year after, or it could be less. So to me, it shouldn't really be about the money. It should be about the policy of, do we accept it regardless how much it is because we can use those dollars to fund really important programs and that energy is in the system anyway. And it is actually coming through when you plug your lights in. And we're talking about a power content label with a good explanation. And, you know, whatever decision we make, if it happens this year, I think we should be prepared that regardless of the dollar amount next year, that's probably how it has to go. It just doesn't seem to me to be prudent to juggling this back and forth and back and forth every year. And that's... Okay. Uh, anyone else care to comment on this? Okay. okay, I don't see any other hands up. Uh, I'll, I was just waiting to, to sort of say my piece. Um, I, I will support the staff recommendation as well. Um, you know, I mean, the first time we debated this, and I, and I did vote, I voted against accepting the nuclear allocation. I was, I was, was torn about it. Um, you know, I, to me, there is a difference between, you know, the $5 million we thought we were saving and the half million to a million we could be saving here. Because I guess the question in my mind is, if, if we, if it, if if there were an amount of money that was going to stop us from doing something or enable us to do something, I might feel differently about it than a, an amount of money that I don't mean to dismiss a half million dollars or even a million dollars. It's a lot of money, but it's, in my opinion, it's not going to stop us from achieving our goals or, or pursuing the things that we are pursuing. Um, and, and, you know, I, you could call it a political argument. You can also call it a, a matter of principle. I don't think, you know, I don't think any of us, you know, imagine starting this because we wanted to sort of, uh, e even even if it's just as a gesture to enable nuclear energy to to go on. Um, you know, again, I mean, we can disagree about that. I, I just personally, you know, I, I, we're looking towards the future. Uh, we're looking to be innovative. And for me, even if it's largely a symbolic gesture with a small financial cost, I don't feel comfortable accepting the nuclear allocation, you know, even just as a, as a you know, as, a, as something on paper. So that is my position. Um, you know, the CAC, I mean, uh, uh, Michael and Gladwin from the CAC spoke a little bit about this, and I think they, they sort of summarized the CAC's overall position fairly well. Um, and I think it came down to just they, they are concerned about both the reputational risk and just the idea of, you know, the principle of accepting nuclear for what is a less, a much smaller, less material amount of, of money than initially initially considered. So uh, I think I've summarized their view on that and, uh, and, and mine as well. If there are no other comments, then I think we are ready for a roll call vote on this. Okay, thank you very much. All right, if you would please say yes or no, yay or nay, when I announce your name. Dave Pine. Uh, Carol's got her hand up. Oh, Go ahead, Carol. I'm so sorry. Could you oh. ex uh, repeat the motion, please? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Here. Okay. Uh, Kat had moved to accept the staff's recommendation, which is accepting the large hydro, not accepting the nuclear, and Rick Bonilla seconded. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, so uh, Dave Pine is a no. Okay, Dave Pine. Okay, uh, Carol Groom. Yes. 
Rick DeGolia. Uh, no. Julia Mates. No. City of Brisbane. Oh, sorry, Madison Davis. Donna Colson. No. John Goodwin. No. Roderick Das Magual. Yes. Carlos Romero. Yes. Catherine Monpour. Yes. Harvey Rarbeck. No. Lawrence May. No. Catherine Carlton. Yes. Wayne Lee. No. Deidre Martin. Yes. Jeff Alfs. Yes. Ian Bain. Marty Hill for Ian Bain. No. Oh, I'm sorry, Marty Medina? No. Did you get Redwood City? Oh, I'm sorry, was Redwood City, I'm sorry, was Ian Bain there? This was Giselle Hale on behalf of Ian, and the vote is no. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so I, I, I do have Giselle Hale as no, Marty Medina as no, Laura Par, Palmer Lohan. Yes. Rick Bonilla. Yes. Floor Nicholas. Yes. Daniel Yost. Yes. Ooh. 11, yes. 10, no. The motion passes. Wow, okay. Wow. All right. Okay. Um, you know, um, again, as someone said, good debate, good, everyone made their points well. Um, I don't think we were voting on the policy forever, but Donna brings up a good point, you know. At some point we probably should, should, should consider, you know, a, a, an ongoing position. But I, mean, I don't think it's on our agenda tonight. It, it's not our agenda tonight, but um, yeah, we could, we, I, yeah, we can bring something back, I think, as a, as a general, as an overall position on accepting, well, various forms, including nuclear, yes. Um, Rick, Rick Bonilla, yeah, wanted to I, say something? I, I second those thoughts. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Daniel. Uh, just on that, I actually think there's something to be said for a little bit of wait and see. Um, you know, see how the reputational risk impacts folks, other CCAs a year from now. Mm. And also, I am one of those people where the difference between 500,000 and, you know, four or 5 million was meaningful. And so, um, you know, I'd be reluctant to put us in a box if the numbers change dramatically in the future. So to the extent something comes back, um, I, I guess my instinct is wait and see. Uh, and, and still, if something comes back, maybe give us some flexibility uh, because the, the dollars can make a difference. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good point too, Daniel. Maybe we're, we're probably all tired of this particular issue right now. <laughs> Tell you what, let's um, maybe what we could do is is put the issue on an executive committee meeting coming up and discuss whether it's it's you know start there and see if it's you know those two positions an overall policy versus a you know a sort of a, a consider circumstances around it going forward. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all. And we're on to item nine, which is the uh, proven expenditure up to 500,000 for a portable battery program for medical, medically vulnerable customers. Uh, this Jan? Hey, Siobhan's going to do this one. On. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Andy, do you want to advance to the next slide? All right. I'm, I'd, um, be happy, I'd be happy to, but Shana's doing the slides. Oh, sorry. I'll ask Shana from now on. Thank you. Um, 
As you guys know, in January, uh, we brought to the board a resiliency strategy to approve $10 million over the next three years. Um, one of the top priorities under that strategy was looking for solutions to serve customers that are most at threat from losing access to power, um, either that, whether that's during a PSPS event or during some sort of natural disaster. And one group of those customers are um, people that rely on power for medical devices. And so we've spent the past um, couple of months working with some of our community partners to identify the best way to serve those customers. Um, we'd initially looked at options for single family homeowners um, installing solar and storage. Um, what we've learned from our community partners is that actually one group of customers that's underserved is renters and people who do not have access to install solar and storage on their own houses. So we've been looking at opportunities um, to help those types of customers through portable battery backup systems. Um, and then in addition, the COVID-19 and the um, closing down sort of delayed some um, installation processes, which also moved us even more into a program that we could get up and running very quickly. So um, today we're bringing to you the recommendation to allocate $500,000 to buy portable backup systems for um, medically vulnerable customers that are most at risk of PSPS events. All right, um, next slide, please. As everyone's well aware, last year, our customers experienced three PSPS events, um, all in October. And we have here some of the 